Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our fourth session of Town Council for 2022. Certainly, this is the biggest crowd I've been in in about two and a half years, so <laughs> welcome. I would just like to share with you that the uh, International Women's Day that was held here in this chamber was a great success, and we partner with the town of Rosse, and each year it flips back and forth, and we take turns hosting. And I'd like to acknowledge Deputy Mayor Schreier. She has looked after this for many, many years, and now she's looking after it, even though she's on council. So thank you, Deputy Mayor Schreier, and thank you for all the sponsorship that you were able to secure for some of the costs. Town of Quispamsis and Rosse for their contribution for that. Also, as we're all aware, the cost of gas is going crazily up. And I would just like to invite you to use the COMEX if you haven't used it yet and if it's something that you might consider. Uh, certainly it's something that we would love to see ridership go up in. It would take uh, cars off the road and uh, it would certainly reduce greenhouse gas production. And the other thing, of course, that's on everybody's mind is the trouble in Ukraine. And I say that with a heavy heart. Uh, I'd like you to acknowledge that behind me, one of our staff created a, a reef in the colors of the Ukraine flag. When you leave, if it's dark, you'll see that we have yellow and blue lights facing the uh, chamber. And also at the uh, cuplex, we have a flag at each end of the arena so that everybody gives a, a silent thought or prayer or whatever your wish is in order to send some positivity to uh, a country that is being overtaken, overrun by a tyrant. So certainly uh, I think it's important that as Canadians that we look after our fellow world citizens. I would like to call upon Councillor Bigger to do the Treaty Acknowledgement in the Moment of Reflection. Oh, sorry, before I do that, uh, Councillor Bigger, I'm going to ask for an approval of the agenda. It's been moved by Councillor Luck and seconded by Councillor Thompson. On the question, please vote now. Oh, and I'd also like to say that uh, Councillor Donovan is joining us from home this evening. He's a little under the weather. Welcome, Councillor Donovan. Motion carried 7-0. Now I would request the treaty acknowledgement, a moment of reflection, acknowledging solidarity for Ukraine. Thank you, Your Worship. We would like to respectfully acknowledge that Quispam Sis exists on the traditional territory of the Wollastuig, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq people, whose ancestors, along with Passamaquoddy tribes, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. We would like to take this moment to pay respect to the elders, past and present, and the descendants of this traditional territory. We would also like to take this moment especially to reflect on our solidarity and support for the people of Ukraine, acknowledging that Canada has the third largest Ukrainian population in the world, behind Ukraine itself and Russia. Blue and yellow lights have been placed on the front section at the Quispam Sis Town Hall to mark our support of those impacted by the Ukraine and Russia conflict. And finally, may we remind ourselves of the important work we have before us tonight including you, thank you. May we make good decisions without prejudice or bias and always in the best interests of our community, which we are here to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bigger. We're looking for a disclosure of interest and Deputy Mayor Schreier, you will have one and I'll call upon you to leave at that time. Presentations by Kennebec Cases Valley High School representative. Would you please state your names for the clerk? Kelly Sisk. Michaela Daigle. Thank you. Welcome. Go ahead. 
Good evening, Your Worship and Council. My name is Kelly Sisk. I'm here representing the KVHS Parents for Prom Committee. I'm also a parent of two daughters, one who will be graduating this year. I'd like to introduce Mickey Daigle, KVHS grad class president, who's also graduating. She will give a brief presentation. We're here because we would like you to consider waiving the $3,600 fee at the QPlex so students can participate in prom and safe grad. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we as parents are tasked to fundraise for this event. We believe that in years to come, students will remember this day and be able to say after two long years of isolating, masking, bubbling, and missed time with friends, that this will bring happiness to our children who have longed for this special day. We are busy fundraising. However, raising funds for an event at our very own community center doesn't seem fair after what families have been through. I know from personal professional experience as a public health nurse how this pandemic has affected families and our youth on multiple levels. Families have had financial hardships and so have local businesses making fundraising that much more difficult. We want to be clear, this is a one-time ask as a result of the pandemic and we are not setting a precedent. Please consider waiving the $3,600 fee for the QPlex for our KVHS graduates. There you go, Mickey. So KVHS is the only high school in Quispamsis with about 250 graduates this year. That's 250 families and 250 futures that will be affected by this. So we are the students, we are the people who are going to be leading this community one day, just like you. And we are asking that the $3,600 fee be waived this year. We want the community center, the QPlex, free of charge. It is a place for people in the community to gather and we think it's a perfect place um, for prom and the perfect place to celebrate the youth in our community. And it's a safe space that parents can feel comfortable um, having their children and not having to worry about anything um, for safe grad and for prom. So last year, the city of Bathurst, um, Kelly's family, um, asked the city um, for the fee to be waived at the Casey Irving Center, which was granted, and they were able to make their prom a much more memorable experience. Um, and even though the pandemic restrictions are lifted, we're still feeling the effects of the pandemic. And um, we think that we, there's been a significant decrease in business donations. It's been harder to fundraise because um, everyone's still feeling the impacts of the pandemic. Many businesses don't have the resources to donate. Um, and we think that with this money, we could put it towards um, extra things to make prom more memorable. And we have been very busy fundraising. We have been selling um, Jabba Moose coffee and mugs, and we're planning on doing an online auction, and we've been raising money at our sports games. Um, and even with this fundraising, it's still been very difficult. People are still struggling um, to find the funds, and we think this money could go towards making prom really unforgettable. And we have found on articles online that the town of Quispansis did have a surplus of over $250,000, and we feel that um, this would be a worthwhile cause to put the, those funds toward as it would benefit the youth in the community. And with these funds freed up, we could put the money towards things like food and decorating and DJs, the things that really make prom special and what it is and memorable. Um, and our theme this year for prom is glitz and glam with over 214 votes, which is about 86% of our grad class. So that really goes to show how much students care about this and really want it to be a memorable experience and how students have really been looking forward to this. Um, and it gives students something to look forward to after two years of uncertainty. And it's really a great time to gather together and we're finally able to carry on this tradition. So we wanna make it the best that we can. Um, prom really matters to people because we can gather together with the student body, with the teachers, with people who have helped us to make it this far and um, really celebrate our accomplishments and our achievements over the past 13 years in school. And we wanna feel supported and valued in our community and we feel that um, this would help in doing so. And it's really a new beginning after the pandemic. It's giving us something to look forward to. And uh, prom is really a big milestone and a big part of growing up. And um, I know personally and many other people in my grad class have really been looking forward to prom. And we wanna make sure it's really um, lives up to people's expectations. Um, and it represents the end of high school. It's really a rite of passage and everyone gets to experience a prom. And, the years before us haven't been as lucky, so we want to really um, carry on this tradition and make it the best that we can. And graduation is something to celebrate, and we think that um, this is really the best time 
to do that. So on behalf of KBHS leadership team and parents and grads of 2022, we sincerely hope that you can support us in our efforts to give the youth in our community a memorable experience. So Madam Mayor, would you accept this proposal? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting in this seat, but guess what? I don't get the say, so. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for your presentation. And I see Councillor Luck would like to comment. So Councillor Luck. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Before I comment, I'm not sure if the Director of Community Services wants to speak to any of... I don't know. No? Okay, perfect. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Kelly and Michaela, uh, for your presentation. Michaela, your grad class, you've made them very proud tonight, so thank you very much for coming and sharing. I also want to commend the parents for stepping up. I know it's been a very challenging few years. Um, my son graduated the first year that COVID hit, so he didn't get to enjoy um, a lot of those milestones and celebrations that uh, unfortunately the youth have missed the last few years. So I'm going to share my point of view. My point of view is that our town should waive the fees for this year only. And here's why in my rationale. Uh, KVHS is our only high school within our town limits. Um, I don't believe this will set a precedent as we did agree to waive fees this past November for a middle school art project at the Qplex. Q, uh, COVID has really sucked, literally, <laughs> for everybody. Um, but one cohort, cohort that I really see that has really been significantly impacted is our youth. And I would love to see them have an opportunity to, going forward to, you know, increase socialization, enjoyment, and create some of the memories that some of the kids have, you know, missed out on in the last few years. I do want to stress that I think this should be a one-time thing due to COVID, as we do as council need to be fiscally responsible with our town resources and the QPlex does need to, you know, cover its expenses. Um, it does appear um, that the project that we originally agreed to waive the fees for um, because of COVID had to be moved to June. So I'm wondering if perhaps there can be some synergy with those two events so that the ice surface only needs to be covered once to minimize costs. Um, and um, I'm also hoping because this was largely due to COVID, our town might be able to, able to access some of our COVID funding to cover this amount. So therefore, I would like to, due to these extraneous circumstances related to COVID, I would like to make a motion that the town of Quispensis waive for one time only the QPlex rental fees for our town's only high school, KVHS, for June 2022. It's been moved by Councillor Luck. Um, I believe, Councillor Miller, you wanted to speak prior to the motion. Uh, Councillor, or Deputy Mayor Schreier, you're seconding the motion? Oh, Councillor Donovan seconded it. I didn't see his hand. I'm sorry, Councillor Donovan. You have seconded the motion. Okay, let's go to questions. On the question, Councillor Miller. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much for your presentation. Well done. Uh, I know it's not good to get up in front of everybody as well, so very good. Um, unlike Council Lock, I, I have a couple of concerns uh, with the request. So so just so you know, I've, I've been to KBHS proms twice, not well, three times to count my own, but when my kids have gone through there. <laughs> so I have a couple questions though on this. So And one will be directed to the dir director here as well. So historically, doesn't the school pay for part of the cuplex and are they not paying this year so and that's question one so I'll start with that so if I may um, what we were told is because of the pandemic and because of the uh, large increase in October they couldn't uh, do any fundraising normally they do um, a spook what is it called spook trail. spook trail in October and then they do a cab cabaret for Christmas that couldn't happen because of the COVID mm -hmm. so then in January we had Omicron and so then at that point, the school had to make a decision. It's getting late. We won't be able to fundraise. They made a decision. It's a hard no. They don't want to do prom this year. So did the, uh, sorry, that so a couple up. So was all the money always from the, the grad class or did the actual um, district, whatever, pay, pay part of it? It was always just grad class money. I'm just trying to confirm. The, the high school raised money with events. Okay. And so they had ample opportunity to raise the money. And now, yeah. because of COVID, they never had a chance to. 
And a second question, are they still going to have as a normally, not, well, historically, not maybe the last year, but you would have the event at the school where you'd be in the gym and they'd have all the, the castles, not the castles, but you know what I mean? They'd have all the, the fun things in. You'd bring in the magician. You'd bring in the hypnist, hypno, hypnotist. Are they doing that anymore? Well, no. The answer is no to that for this year. But what we thought we could do is just that evening combine the, the march their little prom, and then have some activities, fun activities for a couple hours afterwards. Okay, and no, the reason I ask that is because they're two separate events that cost different amounts of money. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to the school, you're gonna have to pay for the janitors. Like even though the parents helped out, you still gotta pay for all that stuff. Um, and you gotta pay for the magician, things like that. So so there, there's that that part of the savings. Cause, um, and from a financial point of view, the, it, it's not quite a community center being the cuplex, we have to cover the ice and things like that. Mm -hmm. So So my question over to the, D director here is how much does it cost just the town just to I mean we have to cover the ice we have to pe bring it back out we have to bring in the janitors or the st staff afterwards it, and all the other schools currently pay Rossi goes there they pay things like that so do, do, just so you know the cuplex as, as a overall uh, the town has a deficit over seven hundred thousand dollars a year in the cuplex so it's not a money-making thing to start with so it is subsidized quite a bit so Thank you, Worship. I don't have the numbers for how many staff it takes to put the f floor down, how many hours, take it up, and all that with me. I can get you that information. I, I can get you that information, well, just, but okay. the cost, the, so the 3600 is also, that's how we come up with pricing. To, to you know, The cost to book that facility is $3,600 for the day, put, and then their tax on top of that. So... Um, you know, it's it would we base that on what our costs are. You know, for it set up and tear down with staff, and then there's all the other things that go with that, whether it's chairs and tables and staging and all of those things. So it's uh, it can tell you it's a four to five hours set up and tear down. But there are some um, that's a busy time of year for us. There, there, we always look for synergy, whether it's with our project. We have Jeu de l'Acadie this year. We have the Memorial Cup this year. Uh, we have Rossé Prom as well. So. There's a lot of events going so going down on the floor at that time, but uh, I can get you the information on the breakdown of, of the cost at a later date, if you like. Yeah, so it, and while I do empathize and sympathize, I, I find it very difficult just to waive the whole $3,600 right now because I also look at, and I've been in that area before, you're gonna merge two into one. And if you can actually keep everybody there for the prom, because historically everybody would go off to the Kingston Peninsula afterwards. So if you can keep everybody after the march and actually stay there, that's a coup in itself. And it, and I and I would recommend if you could do that. But uh, I have a ch I have a really hard time saying yes to to waiving the, the whole fee. So uh, I'll let somebody else speak. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Uh, Councillor Donovan, your worship. Pardon? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Councillor Donovan, sorry about that. Uh, no worries. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know, can you hear me or? milestone for the graduates of our community. You know, it was such a big part of um, my graduation experience, you know, with safe grad and the prom and, um, you know, I really enjoyed it. And I, I really would be upset to see something like that being taken away from um, the children of our community because I know it's so important. Um, I was actually going to make the same motion that Councillor Luck made, but she beat me to it. So that's okay. Um, I am, however, uh, super happy to support um, what she put forward. So, and I, unlike um, Councillor Miller, I have zero um, reservations. I'm not too worried about $3,600. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Uh, Acting CEO, Mr. Kennedy, did you have a comment you want to make? No? Okay, your light was flashing accidentally. So there's a motion on the table. Any other comments on the question? On the question, uh, Councillor Locke, I'm going to put you on hold. You've already spoken. 
Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Worship, and thank you very much for your presentation. Very well done. So was the uh, slide show uh, that we saw that we had in our package here. So thank you very much for that. And uh, you seem to know something about the nighttime ramblings of young people that I don't over around here with King that Kingston Peninsula line. But anyway, <laughs> um, I grew up in West St. John. We went down to Bay Shore. But anyway, that's another story. Nobody wants to hear. Uh, I tend to uh, uh, concur with a lot of what Councillor Miller says. I have a lot of sympathy for the situation that you're in. My partner's daughter just graduated University of Calgary last year. You know, after a five-year run of a very difficult, arduous degree program that took a lot of elbow grease for her to get through, she did really well. It was a complete scratch on convocation, you know, and graduation. And uh, she sat and watched on a laptop as as things went by, saying, "Oh, there you go, you graduated." And uh, she's working now. And and uh, so I, uh, I I totally sympathize with what you're getting at. Here and uh, I don't know if there's some capacity to. Um, I, I guess the motion that's on the table doesn't really allow for this, but I would probably be in favor of trying to make some kind of provision available. Uh, but I also am concerned about uh, not precedent setting because I think that it, you've been really clear about that, and I think that we can just be very clear about that. In my own opinion. Um, but I'm concerned about the fact that we are charged with being stewards of the town's resources and finances and that we operate in a deficit position on the cuplex. It, I, I read with great interest uh, your italicized phrase of community center numerous times in your presentation. And I, I understand the spirit of what you're getting at for sure. And we do want to be a community that not just says that we value our young people, but really shows that in a practical way, you know. Um, but we, the cuplex uh, operates at a deficit as it is, and uh, so I, I just have to raise that concern as well. I, the motion that's on the table maybe doesn't make room for that currently, but um, I, would, I would hope there might be some way to find a way to rebate it or something. That's just a, a thought I'm, I'm throwing out there. But, so. but thank you for your presentation, nevertheless, and, and uh, congratulations on your upcoming graduation. Councillor Olson, please. Thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I would like to direct a question to the director. Um, are we cancelling hockey for that night or use of ice time? Is there lost uh, revenue there? I can't. Uh, we have the event booked. And I. Again, I don't have the schedule for the cuplex right in front of me, so but I do know that there are some hours of hockey, um, but that we've got that book, that events book, so we're booking around that. As I mentioned, we've got Jeu de l'Acadie, we've got the Memorial Cup, and so um, Ross A. Prom. We've got a lot of activities around that time frame, so we're really trying to block out that time, and and uh, we'd be looking at camps later around that time, not during that time, so. The 3600 would help, obviously, is to offset any revenue to, to cover expenses, but then a potential revenue that, you know, for ice in the evenings. I, I guess, else? thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I guess through to the director, we block out all these times for uh, these events in anticipation of them being, the cost being covered. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Olson. Deputy Mayor Schreier, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for your presentation and congratulations on your uh, graduation coming up. I really want to help in some way. And so um, I guess I, I'm wondering within the motion if there's an opportunity that we could add um, the, a provision for finding some synergies if there's somebody else using the cuplex the day before that the floor is down. Um, that, uh, and I guess this question is for the director, if we can find any way to help um, reduce costs by, you know, maybe it's already being put down anyway. Um, and Councillor Luck did bring up a good point about the project that was booked in June. I don't know if that's rebooked or the date on it. Um, so, and that, 
that being said, I, I understand that we have a budget and we have to sort of stick by our budget. And um, this is sort of a new item um, that we hadn't planned for. So, um, but and to try to find a way that we can help somehow, I, I, I really feel co comfortable with that. Um, and whether we need to put our thinking caps up and on and come up with, you know, a 50-50 split, a 70-30 split, what can we do to make it, um, to contribute towards it in some way, some meaningful way. So I'll leave it at that. I don't, I... I'm not sure if you want to read the motion out again so we can hear it. Uh, I still have uh, Councillor Locke who wanted to speak before you read the motion. Go ahead, Councillor Locke. Thank you, Your Worship. I just had a quick question to the community, to the Director of Community Services uh, in regards to synergizing with the middle school art project. I think that they're like literally back-to-back -back days. And is there any feasibility of because the floor is going to be covered for one event, if that could help with the, offset the cost for the second event? Your Worship, uh, so the art project was a donation as well. And we have Jude de Lacadie that was donated as well. And they're looking at five days. So you're, you're at a week right now of donated floor time. So that's seven days of revenue that will be lost at the Qplex for that period of time. Thank you very much on the question. Could we have the clerk read the motion, please? It was moved by Councillor Luck, seconded by Councillor Donovan. Council waive the $3,600 Qplex rental fee as a one-time only for the 2022 KVHS Prom and Safe Grad event due to COVID. Thank you, Ms. Snow. On the question, please vote now. Okay, I can see there. Motion carried 4-3 with nays from Councillor Olson, Councillor Miller, and Councillor Bigger. Motion carried. You're good to go. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs>Have a good rest of your evening. I'm going to ask that uh, Deputy Mayor Schreier please leave. She has a conflict of interest with the upcoming. Yep. Do you want me to say that, that there is a... Uh All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. The mayor acknowledges that council has been asked, requested, and plans to consider amending zone, uh, zoning bylaw number 38 and municipal plan bylaw number 57. Today has been set as the public hearing, which brings you here this evening. We will ask for anyone to speak for or against. You will have a five-minute uh, five period in which you can express your concerns or appreciation of the proposal. 
We will also hear from the proponent of the uh, proposal. Uh, following that, I will ask the proponent to come back up, and I will also ask council to uh, ask any questions in, uh, that they may have. So I'm going to begin with, uh, what's that? And there is a proposed motion on the table, which I don't think I have. So to, oh, okay. We haven't done this in a long time, so I, I certainly appreciate your patience. I am going to ask council to approve the, uh, or to entertain the motion on the table to have the speakers at five minutes, is it? Uh, at five minutes each. Uh, this is different than our 10 minute presentations and a motion of council will change that for us. So could I have a motion on that please? Uh, Councillor Olson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I would move the council adopt the public hearing process steps which provides for a five minute timeline period for anyone wishing to speak for or against the proposed rezonings. Thank you, Councillor Olson. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 6-0. Please remember that we are down one councillor with uh, the absence of Deputy Mayor Schreier. Moving forward, I will now ask for the proponent representing Homestar to please come to the podium and please give your name. Good evening, Your Worship. Uh, my name evening. is Mark Hatfield and Council. Go ahead. Uh, I will put my timer on. Okay. Go ahead. Nope. So as we uh, have taken this journey over the last uh, couple months, um, we're proposing to rezone this area for the future highway commercial property. Um, in this, we're looking at promoting community growth and uh, community uh, structure, job creation, uh, retention, of uh, the uh, middle-aged people of Quispemsis, the tax base expansion, and, uh, and so improving our, uh, our infrastructure. As we look at this, we uh, have looked at this many different ways for the uh, residents of the town, which I hear we'll, we will definitely be hearing from tonight, um, especially in the area that they are. I propose in putting some walking trails in. Um, I look at this as a, as a great opportunity for them to have a second access to their subdivision and also to have a controlled access out of their subdivision. Currently, when you leave Monarch Drive, you're playing the chicken game to get out of there on coming onto their arterial. Um, with the uh, proposal in front of us tonight, we have phase two, which would have a controlled access off of Finney Lane onto the new road up to the arterial, where it'd either be a traffic signal or a roundabout, which would make it entering and exiting into the subdivision a lot easier. Um, we talked about having green space and walking trails for the uh, for the town, the buffering zone. We uh, had a meeting with the PAC where we increased it from. They recommended that they increase it from seven and a half to uh, fifteen meters, which I think is a a great opportunity for us to work with the uh, residents in doing so. Uh, we have spoke to a couple. Uh, we spoke that evening as well as talking about doing some maybe some berming or some fencing for a couple of the neighbors that have no trees due to the power lines and seeing we could work together with them. Um, when I look at this project, we look at the increased tax base for the town and the need of having a more larger commercial areas. Currently, with what's on Millennium Drive, there's no large parcels of land for large stores to come in um, to develop growth. This is something here where we can take this piece of property, um, look at having a larger stores, and I think it's a great use of the property. 
I'm, uh, I'm open for questions, or if I guess it's the, not the time, I will uh, sit back down and hand the floor back over. Thank you very much, Mr. Hatfield. Uh, this would not be the time to, to entertain questions at this point, but you will have an opportunity at the end of the presentation. So now I'm going to call, thank you. Um, now I'm going to call upon residents who wish to speak for or against the proposal to one at a time. Please come to the podium, sir. Please give your name for the clerk. Oh, thank you. I'm Adam Black. And I'm a resident of Monarch Drive, 52 Monarch Drive. Um, so I guess I have several concerns with the proposal. Uh, number one being that the traffic that Mark alluded to of being reduced, uh, I disagree. I think will actually increase, especially with the second exit. Um, I've got two small children that live uh, with me, of course, and as it is now, I'm nervous to let them play in my front yard because of the traffic that we have. I think if there's a roundabout way for people to come in and out different directions, it's actually going to increase the traffic. Of course, the natural traffic that would be included from the new development um, and just the fact that it would be simpler for people to go around. Um, so very concerned with that. Also have concerns with the brook area. Um, the brook that runs through that street, I've actually fished there and my children both fish there now since I was, I was five years old when I moved to the neighborhood. So very concerned that uh, there'd be destruction to the brook and, the, and of course the, the waterways that are there. I know that they're talking about a buffer area, but you know, I don't know if anybody's ever seen a brook around a commercial development. You know, there ends up being shopping carts and just debris and garbage that, that uh, I don't know how we would manage that appropriately. Also in the uh, gravel pit area itself, there is a small wet land area. Used to be quite, quite a bit lar larger, actually grew up playing hockey on a pond in the middle of that property. Um, the previous landowners would have drained that pond years ago now, maybe 10 years plus, but there's still a big natural spring in there um, that every year there's ducks that go there and hatch their, their, uh, their youngs. Um, and I take my children down and we, we usually walk down there. If they're not afraid of you, you can actually go up and see these ducks and, and feed them and things like that. Um, the other thing is also the, you know, the noise pollution, you know, caused during development, uh, light pollution. We've got brand new roads that have just put in the subdivision um, that were just done the last two years. I've been there in that neighborhood 30 years myself. They haven't been fixed uh, before that, so I don't know how long again. I'm concerned about the destruction of that roadway, um, of all the equipment coming in there to develop this property um, and, and what kind of damage that will have. Also, I mean, honestly, just aesthetics, looking at looking out my front window now, um, I'm gonna see apartment buildings or parking lots. Uh, it's just really not something I'm looking for. The walking trail that he mentions, great idea in theory, but who wants a walking trail in their backyard and have people, strange people walking around in their backyard? Very, uh, I guess, violation of people's privacy. So that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, anyone else like to speak for or against? You do not have to give your address, but please give your name. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. Uh, my name is Mike Bone, resident of Quispam Sis. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to express our objections and concerns with the proposed rezoning and development of these 42 acres of land. When my wife and I moved to Quispam Sis in 2020, we chose the area not because of the shopping or development. We decided to move our young family here because of the peace and quiet, the privacy, and to be away from the hustle and bustle of the commercial district. If we wanted to be close to retail big box stores and fast food restaurants, we would have moved to East St. John. It may not look like it based on my hair, but we are in the 25 to 44 age bracket that Mr. Hatfield referred to in his proposal to council. It is a huge assumption that those of us in this age group are looking to live close to retail. When we learned of the proposed rezoning and development, there were several initial concerns that came to mind. First is the noise and light pollution that I believe many of the residents here share. I know Mr. Hatfield suggested the lights would be downward facing, but once the change to highway commercial is made, it, allow, it will allow for large bright towering signs that are lit 24 seven, 365, to draw traffic into these retail stores. After I took the time to review the proposal and watch his presentation, I was just astonished with the amount of smoke and mirrors. By that I mean, in addition to the assumptions he's making, many of the selling points on this rezoning and development are trying to solve problems which have nothing to do with the proposal itself. 
During his proposal, Mr. Hatfield mentioned of speaking with residents on the Marnock Drive area who were concerned that there was only one exit into the arterial road. If this was an actual concern, then the town would be able to solve this without rezoning 42 acres. Further, Mr. Hatfield proposed that he could help ease the traffic burden on Robert Monroe Drive by working with the town to make a potential four-way intersection at his proposed development. This issue is just completely unrelated and a decision on how to solve the traffic congestion at KVHS should be considered separately. Lastly, a point was made that this would solve the issue of getting water to the other side of the arterial. Again, this, is, this issue has nothing to do with the rezoning. This isn't even a problem I was aware of. In fact, if you read any of the 26 emails or letters that concerned citizens sent to council, you'll see that this may create more concerns and problems with the water. Sandwiched in amongst all these solutions is a proposal to rezone the land, which I think is the only thing that should be taken into consideration when council's voting on the matter. Specific to the written proposal, I wanted to make some points on the traffic study. First off, the traffic volume at the Monarch Drive section of the arterial was taken from 2017, which is five years ago. Further, as it was only unidirectional, they used data from Squire Drive to estimate the directional split. This, in my mind, is not accurate enough to reflect the direction of traffic at the Monarch. It does not take into account the traffic from Hampton Road or Chamberlain Drive. I believe the directional split would be much higher in the peak rush hour moments that is estimated. That could easily change the level of service that was quoted in the traffic study. In the end, it's not the development itself that we are against. It's the location. People will always say it's not in my backyard which is specifically why previous councils have worked with the town of Rasse to designate land along Millennium Drive as commercial. There is plenty of land for sale along Millennium Drive. In addition to this, a quick look at service near Brunswick shows that the, the town of Quispam Sis itself owns over 100 acres of land just prior to exit 141, which is the exit leading onto the arterial from Highway 1. If the goals of council are to be increasing commercial tax base, then this should be an area to consider developing. Quispam Sis is a forward-thinking community where families enjoy a safe, friendly, and active lifestyle surrounded by a beautiful natural environment. This is the vision statement taken directly from the town's website. This proposal goes completely against this vision. I hope you keep this in mind as you vote tonight, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Bone. Hello, please state your name for the clerk. Thank you. Chris Pam Sis, Mayor and Town Council. I wish to register my objection for the proposed rezoning of the 42 acres behind Monarch Drive. I've been a resident of Monarch Drive for the past 12 years. When I made this large and inv largest investment of my life 12 years ago, the property behind my home was re re zoned residential. My wife and I looked for several houses before settling down at 71 Monarch. We thought it would be a perfect location to settle down and start our family. Our children would be able to have the ability to grow in a wonderful neighborhood surrounded by other families. After watching the proposal by Mr. Hatfield, I have several piece uh, of the piece of property behind my house to have rezoned as commercial. I have several concerns. The developer mentioned in his presentation that Monarch Drive has one entrance and should Colton Brook overflow and cut off the residents for emergency services. I've been on Monarch Drive for 12 years now and Colton Brook has not overflowed since I've been there. I spoke to numerous neighbors that have been on Monarch for 35 plus years and may have also mentioned Colton Brook has not overflowed to prevent responders getting into Monarch Drive. The developer also mentioned that big box stores are going to attract more families to Quispam Sis, specifically 25 to 45 year old age group, to reiterate what this gentleman said. How much does the developer know about this? Was this survey done to believe such? Who was, the, who was surveyed? Where were the residents all from Quispam Sis? How many residents responded to this? I would be interested to know. These are important, or important questions to ask. I was not given the opportunity to participate in this study, nor am I aware of any marketing efforts about this survey. So who exactly participated in this? The, the developer mentioned 25 to 45 year old age group is shrinking 
and his proposed development, and this will attract them. All of the young families that I know moved out here is to be outside the city limits. We chose to live in Quispamsis for the exact opposite reasons. Quispamsis is a small community in the suburbs with close proximity to the city. We had no interest in purchasing a home in the city, but we wanted to settle down in a community that was close enough to the city that it would be a short commute if we choose to do so. The nice thing about Quispamsis, if I want to go to a big box store, I can nearly drive 10 minutes and be there. I have no desire to have several box stores in my community, let alone in my backyard. The developer wants to talk about the need for a roundabout and lights in phase two. Who's paying for this? The taxpayers? Why should the taxpayers of Quispam Sis be on the hook for a private development? Why should we pay for him to make money? What about the emergency services? Is a current fire complement enough for these big box stores we need firefighting services? Do we have enough adequate equipment to fight these fires? If not, who pays for this additional equipment? Who pays for the extra staff? The developer also said during his presentation that this piece of property would have a tax base similar to Walmart, Best Buy, and Old Navy in St. John. Let's take a minute and visualize this in St. John, these three buildings. This is a commercial area. Can you imagine having a subdivision with hundreds of houses bang smack right in the middle of this high traffic area? That is insane. I also mentioned Sussex Walmart and the Gateway Mall in Sussex as a tax base comparison. Again, no subdivisions within 7.5 meters, or as he's proposing now, 15 meters as a buffer zone. Seems like the developer is going to benefit a lot from the taxpayer while lining his own pocket in the proposed development. The developer talks about big box stores, bigger restaurants and hotels. What about the exist existing businesses of our community? Do we just forget about them? Excuse me. Our municipal plan has designated the area for business. In fact, the municipal plan states a priority is fostering the continued growth and the expansion of the central commercial core in the downtown along Hampton Road. Not only will this proposed commercial area draw business away from the existing small businesses, but it goes against the, prop, the, pr the preparatory strategic plan. I cannot imagine that this will make the existing businesses very happy. Big box stores development, our community, may dislude the future entrepreneurs from starting businesses in our community. What big box stores do to little guys? They can't compete with their prices. They will end up driving small businesses out of this area. As a resident of Monarch Drive, I worry about having such a uh, large commercial space in my backyard. 7.5 meters is not nearly enough, or 15 meters for that matter. I will quite literally have the lights from this commercial area shine into my bedroom every day for the rest of my life. What about the noise? Restaurants open late, stores open till 9 p.m., hotels 24-7. I'm a shift worker. How am I supposed to sleep during these days? The developer plans to have... There are constantly steady flow of traffic. The developer plans to have this home on his property. How early will his workers be arriving to start up equipment? Heavy equipment is noisy. We will no longer be living in the quiet subdivision. Excuse me, sir. Your five minutes have already okay. gone by. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you much, very Mr. Much. Virgil. Thank you. Good evening. Please state your name. Ashley on Monarch Drive. I wish to register my objection to the proposed amendment of Quispam Sis Municipal Plan and rezoning of the 42 acres behind Monarch Drive. <clears throat> I would like to begin by saying that suburban commercial centers, such as the proposed, take up a ton of space. And I, cannot, and I cannot imagine there is anyone in this room that wants to see our picturesque town turned into a Walmart parking lot. Nothing destroys a town's character faster than an abundance of sprawling commercial developments. After watching Mr. Hatfield's presentation to council, I have several concerns that I hope each of one of you as homeowners can appreciate. And I'm gonna go through this fast because I only have five minutes. Council, if you look at policy 9.32, proposal three, council shall consider amendments to the zoning bylaw and in, and in addition to all other criteria as set out in various policies of this plans with regard to the following matters. One, that the proposal is in conformance with the intent of this plan and with the requirements of other town bylaws. Two, that the proposal is not premature or inappropriate by reason of, subsection, the creation of a leapfrog, scattered, or ribbon development pattern, as opposed to compact development. For those of you that do not know, spot zoning is when you reclassify or rezone land to allow a use that benefits the developer, but is detrimental to neighbors, and in this case, to the community at large. 
Spot zoning is the converse of a good planned community since the proposed would be incompatible with surrounded uses and would violate the municipal plan bylaw of our community. Mayor O'Hara and Council, we only need to look at the City of St. John to see the detrimental effects of spot zoning on a community. Quispam, Sayers, Quispam CIS taxpayers love this community for what it offers in contrast to the City of St. John. The recreational amenities that Council has created over the years benefit this community as a largely residential community, one of the best places in Canada to raise families and to retire, not because we have ample commercial big box developments, but in spite of commercial development. Quispam CIS has found a secret recipe to a successful small town community and that recipe is to not repeat the mistakes of the city by allowing developers to build wherever they find land only to benefit themselves and disregard good community planning. Mayor O'Hara, I'd like to refer council to policy 4.82. It shall be policy of council to encourage the consolidation and enhancement of the commercial development along Hampton Road. Clearly this amendment requires that council ignore the existing small businesses on Hampton Road that built this community and that rely on our municipal plan to support them. A big box commercial development outside of Hampton Road does nothing but hurt the existing businesses and it further creates an auto dependency does not make for a livable community. While they are sought after for immediate revenue, they are also an expense. Why do we need this big box stores in Quispam Sis? Um, I would also point out for the record that there was discussion on a public social media page between Mr. Hatfield and another local developer, Andrew Baskin, whereby they discussed to move the Canadian Tire and Gas Bar to Mr. Hatfield's development. This should be an indication that Mr. Hatfield's development is not sustainable but parasitic as it would only feed off established businesses on Hampton Road. The town municipal bylaw, now only four years old, states that it was developed based on feedback from the town citizens. Council used this public information to create long-term policies and proposals to guide future land use and development within the municipality. Why now, after only four years, would we ever consider throwing out public feedback? I would like to highlight some of the goals and priorities of our municipal plan bylaw. Develop attractive gateway to, into the town and revitalize the downtown corridor area to emphasize the pride of community. How does parasitic commercial development support this goal or small businesses that struggled through COVID? Require commercial, industrial, and institutional uses to be physically separated from residential zones through existing natural buffers or the provision of adequately constructed buffer areas. Encourage the consolidation enhancement of commercial development along Hampton Road. Foster the continued expansion of a central commercial core in the town along Hampton Road. Many citizens and professionals came together to create this missile plan and it, is in the best interest of the, it was in the best interest of the taxpayers and the residents of Quispam Sis. It baffles my mind that it could so easily be tossed aside to benefit one person. My last point is about process and apprehension of bias. In Canadian law, reasonable apprehension of bias is a legal standard for disqualifying judges and administrative decision makers such as municipal councils for bias. Bias of the decision maker can be real or merely perceived. Mr. Hatfield was previously appointed by council to serve on the planning and advisory committee for the town of Quispam Sis. For several years, years, Mr. Hatfield served council with many of the same PAC members still serving today. It is reasonable to believe that those relationships and friendships formed throughout the years of service have created at the very least a, per a perceived apprehension of bias. In addition, the town of Quispam Sis website lists two recreational fillies with Mr. Hatfield's company Homestar, the Homestar Dog Park and Homestar Off-Leash Park and I will quote from the town website. It was just getting interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak for or against? Good evening. Hi, my name is Lorreen Hittelt, proud uh, citizen of Quispamsis. And I, previous, I moved here a year and a half ago uh, one of the, part of the reason why I moved here was because I was a uh, neighbor of a big box store, went in and, and changed the neighborhood uh, that I was living in. And, and so I, I'm appealing to council to consider some things that I don't think anybody has mentioned. I'm going to go through, through, uh, through a couple of things here. Um, first of all, um, sorry, I got my, my notes wrong here. Um, There's a lot to be considered, and the things that, things that uh, need to be considered, first of all, is, is we don't need another building center. We have a home hardware, we have a Kent, we have a Canadian Tire, we have a Home Depot 10 minutes away. 
Um, we have places to rent equipment. We have garden uh, supply stores. We, do we need another building supply place? Um, building supply places uh, have uh, lift trucks, uh, lots of uh, vehicles in and out, loading, traffic, noise, idling. What are the big box stores we need in Chris Pamsis? Is it a Walmart, Costco, grocery stores, fast food? Are they going to be open 24 hours? What about the trucks? They're idling, loading, unloading 24 hours a day, backup beepers, clanking of ra uh, ramps, being brought out of trucks and lift trucks moving around, sitting idling all night. We have no bylaw to call in the middle of the night when this happens. Snow plows and tractors working in the middle of the night for a long time. What about noise barriers? Are you going to have noise barriers put up? The residents close by do not buy homes to be affected by constant noise and traffic from large big box store shopping center. Has a noise study been done? What type of nose barriers are you going to put up and how tall are they going to be? Your traffic data was already talked about in 2017. I believe that uh, probably not even done to, um, that has anything to do with full-size trucks, but yet it's going to, going to have a lot of full-size trucks going in and out. Your traffic data needs to be redone and it needs to be done with the proper size of vehicle uh, and, and, and look at your turning radius. Um, also, the truck's going to be parked on the highway because uh, they're, they're going in and out of a fast food joint. Then we have birds, seagulls, pigeons, pests, rodents like rats. Shopping areas like this will invite all types of animals. How is this going to be mitigated? How, how is it going to affect the surrounding area? We had an increase of pigeons. They hung around our houses in our yards. The droppings of uh, pigeons and seagulls are a health hazard. They'll get into our water system. What about the wildlife and curve, uh, cur current habitats. What is stopping this develop from, developer from putting big box stores that are not wanted in this area? In his, in his presentation, the first place he mentioned was a smart center in St. John. Well, smart centers, in, smart centers I have, have a lot to do with them uh, in my past, and they're not good managers. Um, if you drive into the smart center in St. John, and, and very many of them across uh, the, the uh, GTA, uh, Canada, they're empty. Majority of retailers will not put standalone stores anymore. And so are we going to have a white element, uh, white elephant? Fast foods, do we want uh, cars driving through, uh, through, um, through the closed neighborhood area? Fast food restaurants bring people who hang around it late at night. Street racing becomes a, it becomes a gathering party place. And I'm here to tell you, crime increases. It brings, retail brings low minimum wage. We have no traffic and no alternative ways to get there like bikes. We can't get bike lanes now and, we, and, and all of a sudden you're gonna put in a big box store. How do we get there? Large group of kids travel on, sco uh, on scooters in, in this town. It's not safe for them to travel on a highway. We have no low cost housing in this city, but yet we're going to put in jobs minimum wage jobs that require low cost housing. Lighting, lighting standards are, will affect the, the uh, surrounding neighborhood 24 hours a day. The lights will be on and I'm here to tell you it's a problem. Does this fit into our active transportation model? What about climate change? Rossi, St. John and, and Chris Pam are looking to mitigate climate change, but yet we're willing to add more cars, more idling cars and trucks. What is the town getting out of this? I'm appealing to you to have, uh, have more public input and not put this through right away. Garbage, you have garbage, dust, dirt, debris, more traffic, it drags in. And what about water? Where's the water coming from? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Would anyone else like to speak for or against? Would anyone else like to speak for or against? Good evening, please state your name. Good evening, uh, Patty Montgomery, resident of Monarch Drive. So first I wanna say congratulations to all my neighbors. Make me very proud to be part of that subdivision. I have one word. Children, children. I get to sit outside my yard every day and watch children, many children, going up and down our street. They're on their bicycles in the summertime, in the wintertime they're walking with their parents. 
drawn little carts with their parents hauling them. What's that gonna be like when we have huge trucks coming up and down our street? It's not gonna be safe for them. I know we're talking, you know, putting in a walking trail. How many years down the road is that gonna be? In the meantime, these children, and I mean lots of children in our subdivision, are not gonna be safe. Children, priority, right? On top of that, what's gonna to happen to our taxes in our subdivision? What's gonna to happen to our water in our subdivision? I know the last council meeting, I was watching on the TV, I think it might have been Councillor Emilson, talked about perhaps maybe putting in town water. We have perfectly fine drinking water now. We enjoy our water, we have well water. If we have to go with town water, what's that gonna cost to us? Because I think, and I could be wrong, but I think we have to pay from the house out to the street. So that means everybody's gonna be paying for that in our subdivision. What if somebody can't afford that? What if somebody doesn't want it? It's my understanding, even if they don't want that, they still have to pay the taxes on it. If we don't go with town water, let's say the subdivision, the staying put, the, the um, commercial property of the dome that gets built, what happens to our water if we don't go town water? Is it gonna deplete our well water? Is it gonna poison our well water? Talked about animals. What about the adverse side? Yes, this may bring in lots of rats and skunks and everything else, but what about the animals that are living now on that 42 acre property? Where are they gonna be displaced to? Besides our properties, right? So I just wanna come back and say one more word again, children. We need to think about our kids. Thank you very much. I'll ask three times if there's anyone else who would like to speak for or against. Thank you, sir. Please give your name. My name is Ed Earl. Uh, I live at 69 Monarch Drive. Uh, I would like to thank all officials present tonight for allowing us to plead our case in opposition for the commercial rezoning uh, my family and I have moved, or have been living at on Marnock Drive for 34 years. Our house is, the, is on the edge of where Mark Hatfield's property ends, so we're the eighth house in. Um, I have petitioned, and first of all, I'd like to thank everybody that signed the petition. Um, so I collected over 200 signatures against this, uh, this, this development, rezoning. And the main concerns for a lot of the, were the, actually, they were all been brought up today, uh, is the water. How a lot of people want to stay under wells. They don't want to go on town water. Uh, the arterial, uh, Monarch Drive right now is so busy and we have a lot of speeding on Monarch Drive. So there's nowhere really to walk. We don't have sidewalks. Um, bear with me, I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> you do a lot better than I do. Um, in the meeting, uh, he had mentioned going on a well for the first phase. Um, how is that gonna affect our wells if he does that? I mean, we may go dry, and then if he does go on for the next phase for um, public water, again, like I said, nobody wants public water, or town water, we wanna stay on our wells. We don't want that extra expense. Um, the light pollution from commercial lighting will reduce quality of life for the neighbors. I know all these things have been addressed already. I'm just going over them again. Uh, environmental issues have been brought up. Most of the land that resides on the property is wetlands, and many of the animals will run, will be run out of their, their ecosystem as, as the land is being developed. Um, the property, I, the propose, to propose an, uh, to go on to uh, Robert Monroe Drive is very confusing. Uh, I mean, it's, I thought it was used just for the high school itself. I mean, if you're gonna add more traffic to that school, I mean, you're risking not only the students, but the faculty by adding extra traffic to that road. I don't quite understand that myself. Uh, noise pollution, obviously for the first five years of development, all we're gonna hear is trucks going back and forth backup buzzers, I mean, it's just gonna be a nightmare living in that neighborhood. Again, I moved there 34 years ago to bring up a family. I moved out of East St. John. I lived next door to box stores for that reason, because I wanted to come to a nice, quiet, 
town. And that's where I thought I was, I was living. I know a lot of neighbors, if they, we're gonna have a hard time selling our homes if we wanted to sell our homes with this going on in the backyard. There's no way people are gonna to wanna to buy right next door to this development. I can't see it. Anyways, I appreciate the, your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I'll ask three times. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against? Thank you, sir. Please give your name. Uh, Wade McFadden. I'm a resident of Monarch Drive. I uh, just want to register my, um, we don't want this in our neighborhood. Um, you know, Mr. Hatfield, uh, I'm not going to reiterate because, you know, the neighbors, we all share the same concerns out there. So, um, but Mr. Hatfield bought uh, a price tag of, you know, he paid residential price tag on that piece of property. And that's, that's what it is. Um, if he wishes to go commercial with big box stores, then go in commercial zone, pay the price, and, uh, you know, carry on. It's already zoned for that. Um, you know, I've been there since 2008. It's a, it's a neighborhood that was, you know, I was drawn to. I have family that lives there also. It's, you're going to take away that piece of, little piece of heaven that we have, you know, off the arterial. It's a dead-end subdivision. It has been for over 40 years, um, and it's very attractive for, you know, young families coming in there with children, because that's where I started with my children. So please, counsel, don't take this away from us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McFadden. I'll ask again, is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against? Welcome. Could you please give me your name for the clerk? Hello, my name is Jen Dobson. I'm a resident currently on Monarch Drive as well. Um, I'd like to thank you all for hearing out my neighbors. I am very proud of them. And if I had more to say or more planning, I would probably pick up your speech right where you left off so I could finish it, but that's okay. I have so No, I got something else in mind. I'm not going to keep anything for much longer purely because my neighbors have done a fantastic job of already throwing everything out there. Heartstrings, facts, points, everything that's need to be made. Um, I've known most of you my whole life, one way or another, whether it be personal or through work. So as most of you would know, I live in kind of a precarious spot where I am both a resident of this whole situation, as well as I do work retail. So I do understand the want and need of developing our community and our city, having more jobs and everything like that. Um, I'm simplistically going to pull on the smallest of heartstrings. I was born on Monarch Drive when it was still Milligan. My front deck has been renovated five times over. My brother fell through it at one point because he was yelling to our neighbors that I was born. I am that child. I have recently just gotten engaged and we are hoping to buy a residence on Monarch Drive at some point in the very near future. The main key points of that are the memories I have with my friends down the road looking at the stars and the comets and all of the beautiful nature. Uh, our neighbor's goldfish being eaten by cranes because they had babies and decided to come over and eat the goldfish she bought that year. And just those little key things that we've all experienced as children that I want to make sure that people continue to experience, whether they be my kids, my foster children, my neighbor's kids, whatever it might be. I don't want that to go away. I'm not saying that we shouldn't develop. I'm just saying that this right now is not what we should be looking at. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Dobson. I'm going to ask three times if there is anyone who would like to speak for or against. Welcome. Please give your name to the clerk. Hello, my name is Jill Bone. I'm just speaking on behalf of actually Virtual, is it? Virtual and Jason, uh, Justin, sorry. Uh, just to finish off, I mean, we all share the same idea, so just to kind of go forward and finish off what she had to say, which was so lovely. So why should the residents of Monarch have to suffer when there are perfectly good pieces of property available for purchase that are already designated commercial? The, develop the developer mentioned in this presentation that there were no other commercial areas of that size available. But I was driving on Millennium, me as well, uh, and noticed this uh, the other day, that there happens to be 40 acres across from Kent with a for sale sign up. Out of curiosity, I decided to call the real estate agent Mayor and council, do you know how much 40, or is it 42? 42 acres of designated commercial space sells for in the KV area? $10 million. I am wondering why that piece of property is already, already designated commercial. 
oh, that was already designated commercial, was not considered for his development. I'm guessing, number one, it was too expensive. And number two, if I remember correctly, our neighbors considered putting a Walmart on that piece of property a few years ago, and the residents were not interested in having big box stores in the KV area. What has changed? Residents still do not want to see big box development or big box development in the valley. It is right, or is it right, that a developer can purchase 42 acres of residential property for 300,000 and then have it changed to commercial? Who is this benefiting? Is it really the community the developer cares about? I think no. The municipal plan designated this area as residential. The municipal plan was developed with feedback from the town citizens, and now the town is considering changing it to benefit who? One person? Is this really what our community wants? Bigger is not always better. More is not always a sign of success. We see our roads paying the price with wear and tear, bigger traffic problems um, occurring and making our roads less safe for our children and those who still enjoy getting out in the community for walks and, their, and biking. We are not a city and I do not think the residents of Quispam aspire to be one. Our municipal plan has dedicated areas for this development. We do not need to rezone residential areas to commercial for progression. It is parasitic and drives business away from existing small businesses in Quispamsis. We are a town and residents are content to stay that way. I ask you please take my concerns along with many other residents who object strongly to the rezoning and make, before making a decision on moving forward. Let us not be disillusioned by the promises and demands of big business on our beautiful town. Please listen to the concerned residents who strongly oppose this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bowen. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against? I will ask a second time. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against? Thank you, sir. Please give your name for the clerk. Uh, my name is Roger Fowler. I live on Ashfield Drive. And uh, I wasn't going to speak, but I, everybody else spoke. I'm going to say my two cents. <laughs> um, my wife and I have lived there on Ashfield for 36 years. Uh, we've got a four-lane highway behind our house on Ashfield. We've got a gravel pit at the end of our subdivision. Railway tracks on the other side. And then you got the artillery. Uh, we walk every numerous times a day, as our neighbors know. And coming down Monarch, we, sometimes we have to get off and get into people's driveways. They drive so fast, there's so much traffic. We don't need any more traffic on Monarch Drive. Coming home tonight, the supper time, which I don't have to do because I'm retired, but uh, turning left onto Monarch, coming from Daly's, we have a little center lane there you, you use. There's four cars behind me, and you're taking your life in your hands right there. They're coming this way, they're going that way, and I'm in the middle. We don't need another one two or 300 yards behind us. So uh, I'm objecting to this uh, so proposal, and uh, I hope council uh, will listen to everybody that spoke today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I will ask again. I'll ask three times. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against? Thank you, sir. Welcome. Please give your name for the clerk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Brandon Howland, and um, I live in one of the four properties uh, that's going to be affected by uh, this development the most. Uh, my fiance and I uh, were new, new homeowners on Monarch Drive. We've only been living there for about a year and a half. And, you know, first of all, I wanted to thank all of you folks in, on council for, for showing up here tonight and listening to us. Um, I'm going to go a bit off script because I don't want to repeat what other people have said. But uh, there's two two really big things for me that are important to talk about. Um, you know, I feel, you know, if I was, if I put myself in, in a position where I own, I'm a business owner and I'm proposing to develop someone's backyard, uh, you know, put a parking lot in there for industrial equipment or whatever, whatever have you, um, I would 
you know, I feel like I would show the residents a little bit more respect than what we were shown. Um, I was, I found out about this development from hearing about it from one of my neighbors. Um, you know, I would have appreciated a phone call, an email, a letter, some sort of a notification that this uh, development was potentially going to occur. Um, you know, one day I come home from work and there's someone in my backyard uh, marking property lines. And, you know, I just feel like if I was in those shoes, I would at least show people the respect to let them know when, when I was going to be, you know, marching around in their backyard and, and, and marking the property lines. Um, so I think there was also like a lack of, there's a lack of care and a lack of detail. Um, the rezoning notification that was sent out uh, to all the neighbors within 100 meters uh, has, has conflicting information on it. Uh, one figure on the, on the plot plan that's shown has the phase one development ending on the northwest side of the transmission lines, which is roughly a 100 meter gap between our, my backyard and, and the proposal. And then the other plot plan on the same rezoning notification shows uh, what appears to be uh, a parking lot for industrial equipment uh, seven and a half meters from my property. Um, you know, at the end of the day, everyone kind of talked about, you know, generally the same thing. You know, there's, there's concerns around noise, added noise. There's health concerns with the added fumes of all the potential diesel fueled equipment that would be idling in those yards. Uh, there's concerns on the lights that are going to be added. And, you know, as a young professional, um, my fiance and I plan on starting a family in that home that we purchased. And, you know, I like to think of myself as a reasonable person. And it doesn't get me too excited to think of what it would be like uh, raising, raising a family, having babies in a house where you can hear loaders and stuff uh, going all hours of the night inside your house and have these bright lights shining in. Um, it makes me a, a bit nervous, to be honest. And, you know, I think that if it did go through, I would probably be, be forced to sell and move, which I really don't want to do. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, I left, left the apartment living to buy a property, um, get the privacy, um, and, uh, you know, I feel like that's uh, being, being taken away, away from me after only living there for a year and a half. Um, I guess, like, in summary, uh, to me, it just, it doesn't make sense to rezone residential land to commercial space. As it's already been talked about, uh, there's plenty of commercial land for purchase in the Quispamsis area, even some just down the road from Monarch Drive. I guess what I'm, what I'm asking council to do is just, you know, follow the keep it simple rule. The area of the proposed development is zones residential, and I believe it should stay as such. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I'll ask three times if there is anyone else wishing to speak for or against. Is there anyone else wishing to speak for or against? Final time. Is there anyone else wishing to speak for or against? Thank you. At this time, I'm going to ask Mr. Hatfield to come back up to make a final summation. Welcome back, Mr. Hatfield. Welcome, Your Worship. In hearing everything, um, which I understand totally, a lot of things were said that uh, I guess were out of context in my feelings. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on every single one, but there's definitely things that are not 100% truth. Um, as we talked, as I made my presentation and talked about different things, was the potential of helping different situations. For instance, Monroe Drive it was the potential that the traffic uh, master plan talked about a problem. And I said, there's potential for us maybe in the future to work together with the town and the province to do something. Um, I've never talked about bringing water down 
Monarch Drive, nor was there any talks, I think, in PAC or in any of our meetings about bringing water down to Monarch Drive for the residents. We talked about bringing it across um, at my expense or at a cost-sharing expense with the, pro with the town to bring it into our development. Um, the land at the end of uh, the highway, the exit um, by the McEsso, there is a lot of town land there, but that is all uh, considered uh, water reserve land for the wells and the aquifer of that area. So none of that land can be developed. I did look at that in the past. Um, at the end of the day, we're trying to work with, uh, with the residents for this piece of property. Uh, again, I don't feel that the, the Monarch Drive traffic is going to increase. So the fact that people were going into this potential new uh, commercial space from the arterial, I don't think they're going to be exiting going through Finney Drive to come back up Monarch. They're probably going to turn around and go right back out on the arterial. And again, the connection doesn't have to be made. That was a suggestion that I made to work with the town and work with the subdivision to have a second exit. It doesn't have to go and connect to Finney Drive. It could go right up to it and there could never have to be a connection. So this area could be on its own, separate from everything else where there is no traffic concern to the, uh, to the residents of the subdivision. Um, when I look at it, this is uh, what I'd like to put forward to council and I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hatfield. Uh, at this time, we have PAC's written views. And Mr. C Mr. Colburn, would you, uh, I guess I'll ask if one of the councillors has those opened, if they could read those. Councillor Miller, do you have the written views of, uh, of PAC in front of you? I believe it's on page 59, if I'm not mistaken. Do you have those up? Yes, the written reviews, yes. Um, yes, please, my, uh, my voice is going. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. So I'll read out the written views that happened at PAC the other day so, you, so everybody understands what, what's happening. Um, the matter requested, as we're just talking now, I'll, I'll talk about the decision of the committee on uh, March the 8th, 2022. Decision of the committee, that the Planning Advisory Committee proceed with supporting council and rezoning applications to amend the Municipal Plan Bylaw 054 and Zoning Bylaw number 038 for the rezoning of PID 173-765 and 25017 from a single two-family to a highway commercial HC subject to the following terms and conditions. The creation of a 15 meter buffer zone as it relates to the neighboring residential R1 zones must be shown in the final plans with alternative options to be discussed between the town and developer. The developer also must undertake the extension of the municipal water system to the area prior to phase two development. An engineered designed stormwater management plan and drainage system stamped by the registered professional engineer licensed to practice in the province of New Brunswick is to be completed and submitted for each phase of the development. Street lighting at the entrance of the de development shall be installed. Non-signalized control methods, as per traffic analysis, analysis report, must be installed at the Route 119 access point for the Phase 1 development of Phase 1 level of the development. A signalized intersection at Route 119 across access location must be installed once development of the full build-out and connection to Finney Lane is underway, the cost of the construction of the signalization intersection will be on the developer unless the developer enters into a cost-sharing agreement made with the town and or province. Details regarding a cost-sharing agreement arrangement shall be noted in the developer's agreement. All building light fixtures and parking lot lights are to be downward directed. All materials and equipment ordered on-site are the responsibility of the developer. The developer is to enter into a developer's agreement with the town of Quispam Sis. The developer shall undertake to complete the work for each approved phase within a reasonable time period, recognizing the development agreement carries a two-year time limit. The land shall be developed in accordance with the building and development plans filed and approved for the town in each phase, and if the development does not substantially proceed within six months of the date of approval in, for each phase, the developer shall restore the lands to the attractive natural state and such restoration is to be completed within 60 days. 
Number four, other. The Planning Advisory Committee, or PAC, support is only for the rezoning PIDs 173-765 and 250217 from single or two-family development to highway commercial as outlined in the received plans and further review of the PAC may be required as the development proceeds. This was dated um, the ninth day of March, 2022 and signed by Violet Brown, the secretary. Thank you very much, Councillor Miller. We have with us uh, also uh, Mr. Colburn over here and he is the Municipal Development Officer. So I'm going to open it up now that Council may ask questions if they would like. They may ask questions of the proponent or if they need technical questions answered by our uh, Development Officer. So questions. Are there any questions on behalf of the Council? Councillor Miller. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Mr. Hatfield, and thank you for all the residents who took the time to speak and also to write in. Um, I just would like some clarification. Some of it was brought up as questions today. When reading through all the documents, the 38-page traffic study and, and a few other things, I did, and it was brought up as a concern as well. Um, the traffic study, the analysis was from 2017. The, then the directional was from 2019, and since 2017 to now, there has been significant amount of changes, whether it's on down by Squires, down anywhere, uh, coming across the development, coming out many of the different subdivisions. Um, so I, I guess I have a, I'll have multi questions, but I'll start with the one. Um, why was 2017 used? Because I also know it stated that there's a couple things in there. It stated that it was a 2017 study. Um, there was a 1% growth anticipated. Our, you know, I, I don't know the car count there, but you know, our town's growing by more than 1% each year. Um, there was also a discussion on, was used 2019 for, for, for the, uh, the way, but also there was discussion also in there that quoted Ontario uh, rules. There was talking about a turning lane and what was efficient, sufficient for a turning lane. So uh, we just, when I think of that, that whole road, whether it's phase one or phase two, there should be a turning lane going left. And 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 anyway, so I'll, I'll let you respond to those and I, I've got a couple of other, if you, if you would, please. Thanks. Certainly. Um, I'm looking at the study. The study was researched out by Englobe. Um, I'm assuming and at this moment, I can't speak on their behalf, but this, the study they would have, the information they would have would have been from 2017. That's what they would have based their study on. Um, this was just your preliminary traffic impact study showing that whether there's going to be concerns or not concerns. Um, if we move forward with the process and get into the developer's agreement, a full traffic study would be required. Um, Dwight could speak on that behalf to correct me if I'm wrong. But this was just the preliminary study to get the talks going, to bring it to council, to show that there is not a big concern from their, and their standpoint. But what they identified is what the potential needs will be in the future. So for them using 2017 information, I'm assuming that it was because that was the data most recent that they had to their knowledge. Through you, Worship. So um, as council is aware, Route 119 is a designated highway under the authority of the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, which means any access that would come off of Route 119 into the uh, adjacent properties would require it to be a public street. So as part of that, as part of any request to, to create a public street or access, you're required to get a highway access permit. And part of that process is to submit to the Department of Transportation uh, an adequate sort of review study to show what the level of traffic would be generated from the proposed development. So in this particular case, because you're going through the rezoning process, it would be taking the preliminary data to identify some areas of concern um, at this stage, and then how would that be addressed? So as this, the uh, traffic study indicated, because it's two phase and based on the development level at phase one, that adequate measures could be on uh, signalized intersection. Okay? And then when you go beyond that, given the de pros development and the potential level of development uh, and the scale of it, then you would get into signalized intersections. 
Again, we recognize that it was uh, a study that was done to provide an adequacy to the Department of Transportation to look at even entertaining and being able to identify the appropriate location for the access because there are challenges in terms of uh, sight lines, uh, the proximity to Monarch Drive, the proximity to the uh, um, bridge for the for CN. So there's very limited areas where you could actually have an access. So part of the study was to identify where that access could happen and then some initial um, means of controlling traffic. So would it be a full out signalized traffic intersection right from the start or could that be triggered as part two? So in terms of in terms of the, the data that's in there, uh, as we move through the process, it would be required to go back and then review that particular data and a, and a traffic study to show that it's all encompassing and look at if there's additional measures that need to be put in place and expanding the scope. So we'd be looking at uh, probably further data to, uh, to, um, to bring it up to where it would be in terms of 2021 or 2022. And I anticipate, again, it was done by Inglobe, uh, so we would, you know, unfortunately they're not here to speak in terms of the use of the data, but they probably would have retreated from what was available from the Department of Transportation at the time, as the town does not have uh, data with respect to Route 119, as it's under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation. So. Thank you, Mr. Colburn. Um, Councillor Miller, did you have anything else? You did. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm sorry, I was just going to ask. I'll only ask like three, then I'll let everybody else go. And if my other ones don't get questioned, I'll go from there. Um, another thing is, you know, I've been here a long time too. I think 1970 when I moved here, so been here a long time. Um, with the brooks and that that run through there, how does this go with the Department of Environment, and what are the rules and regulations when you start getting into brooks? Uh, I know there was a uh, discussion when we when somebody was talking about the pond where the where the gravel pit was dug out. I don't know if that would be considered obviously a, a wetlands. It's it's kind of turned into one just because of how deep, deep they dug. But what is, there's, there, I'm gonna ask two questions at once. The, so you got the brook going through. So what are the, uh, what has to be done with the Department of the Environment to make sure that that's that way? And also um, mm -hmm. first time ever, and I've been here for nine years, not as long as many others, but it's the first time ever I've also seen a, a note come in from CN Rail about phase two on what you can and can't do with the vibrations and things like that. So uh, it's kind of a, uh, a double question, but on the thing, like the, you've got the environmental side, what does the Department of Environment get involved in? And what context and what is the ramifications of the comments from CN Rail? Um, thanks. And just one more after that and then I'm done. Thank you. Your Worship. Um, on the environmental, we have contacted environmental um, and they have no, uh, no qualms about this piece of property. There's no environmental outstanding wetlands on the property. You do have Colton Brook, um, which we have buffer zones. Uh, we have to follow by the guidelines of the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and uh, of the Department of Environment, which we are all in abidance with. So there's no, uh, there's no wetlands on this property. Um, stormwater management plan would also be done as PAC recommended so that we are a net zero um, producer, meaning that we're not producing any more water holding ponds, et cetera. There'd be a storm water bit pan on the developer's agreement. And when we get into the CN rail, that's everything that we discussed with them um, prior, to, uh, prior to this meeting. And that's all in accordance with what our game plan would be with the property. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Miller, I'm going to go to Councillor Thompson. Uh, you've had two questions there, so. Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you, Urshu. Uh, I guess my question is to Mr. Colburn. The, um, as the developer, you know, develops the site, it's going to be wells d dug, I'm assuming, because our, our, our town water supply is not close. So uh, my, my question is, if there's, if it's well water, then there would be a, a comprehensive hydrological study would have to take place if they're drilling wells. Go ahead, Mr. Colbert. Through you, Your Worship. 
home. So the zoning bylaw identifies that when you go through a rezoning process, the, the, the demand of the development um, dictates the scope of the, the study that would be done. So if you have a high demand um, type of usage, so for example, if you have a hotel or um, you know, some, some development that, that demands high of the groundwater, then a hydrogeological study is required or a comprehensive study. So, and then when you get into any developments that would require actual sprinkling, uh, obviously we would look at supply of municipal water because it's uh, a bit of a challenge to provide a sprinkler system from a, a well. In order to do that, you'd have to have on-site storage, some sort of cisterns. So in this particular case, we would look at phase one to determine what is the actual demand. So a qualified engineer would look at what is the proposed buildings that are going in there, what is the anticipated uh, level of uh, demand on the groundwater, and then from at that, a minimum would be an abbreviated study, but um, depending on the usage that would come back, then it may would it could move towards a comprehensive. As noted in the recommendations of PAC, anything that moves beyond phase one would require the extension of the municipal water system. Um, so at this stage, it would be looking at what are the proposed uses and their, their water demands at phase one, and then that would dictate what would be the level of study that would be required uh, reflective of those uses. And then that would go into the development agreement as the terms and conditions. Again, we always go back to, um, it is a decision of council of how they would wish to set conditions in terms of the usage. So if it is a desire of council to say we require a comprehensive study at phase one, then that would obviously go into a development agreement, which would be a condition that would have to be met uh, through the process. Was there a follow-up question, Councillor Thompson? No? Any other councillors have any comments or questions? Councillor Olson. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you, Mr. Hatfield, for your presentation and to uh, all the residents who have appeared here this evening and advised us of their concerns. <clears throat> I just wanted to reference uh, my uh, comments on uh, water going across the arterial. Um, I think we, uh, majority of us can probably remember the uh, contamination that was in Rossi down across from, in, in Oakville Acres, where uh, there was a contamination from a dry, uh, from a dry, uh, um, a clothing dry cleaning business. And that was contaminated for several years. Also, uh, I've experienced uh, uh, a, a contamination in Chatham and Newcastle where their water system was contaminated and for over two years the community had to uh, deliver bottled water. Um, I just, when I made the comment, uh, a general type of comment about this proposal, uh, recognizing that the town of Quispam Sis has probably got about 10% of the population on community water, which I, which I believe is a uh, is a weakness in our community. And uh, we all have uh, well water. Uh, I mean, I have well water in my subdivision. I've been there 48 years. But uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a, an interest in, in uh, developing the water system. It's just that we haven't applied a lot of money to that yet. But at some point in time, we are going to have to. And uh, the uh, the idea that in a major development like this, if it happened, that we would uh, possibly have a chance to partner with the developer to cost share on the introduction of a water system over to that property, and it could expand, but it would be a partnership with the town contributing to a potential major, uh, major uh, expansion of the, uh, of, the, of the water system in the town but at uh, a shared cost. So that was my uh, allusion to that, uh, to that uh, water question. So it's just uh, you don't have an opportunity a lot of times to have a partner 
on uh, on water distributions in a municipality. So that was my uh, that was my reference back then. But uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hatfield, for your for your presentation. Thank you, Councillor Olson. I'm going to go to Councillor Thompson. Uh, sorry, Councillor Donovan. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, this question I have is for um, Mr. Hatfield. And uh, my question is, do you have a plan in place to ensure that, you know, if this gets approved and it goes ahead, that your developments will be filled with, um, you know, stores that are, that, that are stable enough to last in this community? Um, because you've mentioned quite often um, the Smart Center in St. John, and I don't know if that was maybe your best idea to mention something like that because I've seen the Smart Center in St. John and a lot of those stores are actually empty. So um, I'm just looking like for a, an answer as whether or not you have a plan because the last thing I want is to, you know, approve something like this and have, you know, like five, six, seven stores just sitting there taking up space doing absolutely nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Did you want to respond to that, uh, Mr. Hatfield? Go ahead. Thank you for the question, Councilor Donovan. Uh, at this point, there's no exact people or uh, businesses in place that would be coming to there. Um, when I referenced the Smart Center, I was more or less re referencing the idea of the development of the size of, uh, of the idea. By no chance, by no, by no term was I trying to use the Smart Center as the uh, as a mockery or as a, a, a name of something I want to put there. That was just the idea of having a large development where you have a connecting street and large stores around it. Um, at this moment, no, uh, we're too preliminary to have any uh, anything secured down um, for any commercial or uh, any type of tenants. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Donovan. Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hatfield for your Bookended <laughs> presentations uh, tonight, and thank you very much uh, to all of the residents who've come and who've spoken. Um, some very, very vitally important uh, feedback, and really uh, some things that I would never have thought of. Probably, I'm, I'll just be very honest about that. So, very in insightful stuff. Um, I take note uh, of how. You point out um, when you came back up to give a bit of a summary that uh, some of the things that, as it turns out, some of the things that I had sort of put question marks beside having gone through the report a few times, uh, you sort of basically summarized, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and said, look, these are just ideas. I'm not saying these are things that necessarily have to be done. The, the Monroe uh, turnabout idea, uh, roundabout idea, the Finney Lane extension, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, I'm, and I don't want to overgeneralize, you know, because I think there are some, again, some genuine concerns being raised here, very serious concerns by people, keenly felt. But uh, I, do, I do sort of pick up on a sense of, you know, wanting to, I take this report to be coming in and, and making the biggest ask that you can. As a business person, it seems to me that there's, you've got nothing to lose by coming in and putting your best foot forward and being ambitious. I appreciate that you have to have uh, an, a certain amount of vision as a, as a business developer, uh, especially developing commercial uh, business in what you know is largely a residential community. Uh, and your business is, is uh, of course, very much about residential communities and so on. But so I appreciate that there's a lot some ideas and vision and let's you know try to but I hear a, 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 a like a pliability there a sense of like well you know these things aren't necessarily set in stone there is room to to uh, negotiate on these things I feel as though a developer's agreement would have to take into account many of the things that we're hearing tonight if it was to be approved uh, so I just want to make I just want to confirm that that's your your attitude I guess if you don't mind my being so frank with that word. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, the quick second thing I'll just say is over to our uh, director of planning. Uh, I'm just reading from the, uh, the Don Moore survey uh, report, uh, Mr. Colburn, that was part of Mr. Hatfield's uh, proposal on stormwater management. 
And I was just curious to get uh, your insight or your feedback or just your opinion, if that would be all right. I'll just quickly quote from it here. Um, uh, let's see here. It says, um, as the site is developed, stormwater management would be performed on the development site to limit peak flows to pre-development areas. Typical approaches that would be considered would be, typical, uh, typically commercial buildings have a flat roof. We would plan to detain water on the roof of the building using flow controllers on the roof drains. Typically, we design this system to pond the equivalent of 100 millimeters of water in a 100-year event. Seems to be kind of industry standard. New parking areas would be designed to have a catch basin system which will collect the water and direct it to a piped storm sewer. The parking lot areas around the catch basins will be graded to create ponds, quote unquote, at the catch basins and inlet control devices will be installed on the catch basins to limit peak flows into the piped system. This results in water ponding on the parking area in peak uh, rain events. And I think I can stop there. So I'm just wanting to get a little insight uh, as someone who doesn't have a background in municipal planning <laughs> or engineering uh, as to the suitability of that. I, I, my concern is about runoff into uh, neighboring properties. And so I'm just wondering if you could comment on that at all. Go ahead, Mr. Colburn. Thank you, Worship. Through you, Worship. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Bigger. Um, so the way the stormwater management uh, process works with these types of developments is when we look at what we call pre-development and post-development flows. So you basically take the lands as it sits today and we contribute to what we call basically, we call it a C factor or some value. So you basically have vegetation, raw land. And you look at what amount of flows actually come off of that land at a certain rate. So then you factor in all the hard surfaces. So you start, you factor in the buildings, the rooftops, the, the streets, the hard the asphalt surfaces. And if you were to take all that water that's collect, runs across the yard surfaces and, and was to come off that site, obviously there would be an imbalance of what it does today and what it would have done post development. So what you try to do is you try to do what you call a balance or net zero, which means you have to introduce elements or mechanisms into your design so the water actually gets collected, held on site, and then released at a rate that would reflect or mimic what it was pre-development. So there are many ways of doing that. So we've talked about actually re retaining it on the rooftops. You can actually do it by what we call uh, retention ponds, and you see some of those throughout the town where they fill up. There's one on the Petengo Road. So when you have heavy events, the water holds, builds in there, there's a release. So there's usually smaller pipes or mechanisms that restrict the flow over time. So over a period of time, it dissipates and it mimics that flow coming off. You get things like bioswales, which means between the parking lots, you can have um, grassed areas or with trees and underneath that you can have uh, soils that absorbed the water, which slows it down. Um, catch basins, you can have deeper catch basins that actually hold and hold the water for a while. So that's what the consulting engineer is indicating, that the site has the ability in the area to introduce such measures to actually reduce and control the flow so you're not getting this large inundation of flow coming off. When we look at this particular area from a planning perspective and engineering perspective, one of the other things is we want to be is we want to be sensitive to some of the environmental elements in there. So you have the Colton Brook. When you look at commercial developments, or where you have parking or you have trucks, you want to think about things like oil scepters and those types of things. So they're actually built in there as well. So there's areas that control that, which actually looks at, and that's not the quality of the water that's coming, the, the, the quantity of water, but also what is the quality of the water that's coming out and being released. So all of that stuff would have to be taken into consideration and meet in terms of standards and specifications that again would go into development agreements. Now I could just add to that, through you, Worship. The ask that's before council in terms of rezoning and we go with a development agreement. The development agreement at this stage would be with respect to the land as a whole. When you actually get into individual developments, you have on top of that additional development agreements. So 
when the buildings start to come or developers start to come and start building on this property. It's just not this development agreement that regulates that. The zoning bylaw says that every new development is subject to a development agreement. So we would actually take that application, look at it. If it requires additional, more stringent measures, then that gets put into that particular development agreement. So there's multiple development agreements that would take place to control and regulate what actually happens on the site over time. Thank you, Mr. Colburn. Uh, did you have a follow-up, uh, Councillor Bigger? If not, I will go to Councillor Luck. Uh, just, one, just one quick one, yeah. Uh, the, uh, I guess, well, perhaps follow-up is not exactly the right uh, way to describe it, but I'm also, I just also just want to express concern about the buffer zone. I, I know that there was the, some discrepancy about the seven and a half versus the 15, but I just hear a lot of voice concern about that. And I, I just want to say that I, in my, that's why I ask about your pliability on, you know, being able to work with some of these concerns, because that just doesn't seem to cut the mustard for anybody that we're hearing from tonight. And, uh, not that I'm coming down on one side or the other at this point, but I, I just hear those concerns. And also like trails butting up against the back of uh, people's yards and, and all of that. I, I, I was in, I have friends in Stittsville, west of Ottawa. I was telling Councillor Luck before the meeting that their house is, uh, that's, a, a, that's a suburb of you know, Ottawa and it's a very, uh, it's a fairly affluent kind of community. And uh, their yard is uh, up against a trail for sure that, that is, uh, there's a high sort of uh, kind of hedge, probably 12 feet tall or something, you know. And when you sit it on their back deck, all you know, all day long, more or less, you hear people coming and going because there's a there's kind of this tunnel this that's created down between. Because of course, on the other side of that trail is another 12 foot hedge, and then that's the backyard of somebody from the next street or whatever. And people seem to coexist happily enough there, but I suppose people moved there and it was already there. Uh, but uh, anyway, I uh, I can see what people are getting at, and I just want to say I you know I I would look to uh, I would hope to see some really creative modifications on that to be to kind of be able to support this. So but anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bigger, and Councillor Luck, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my uh, comment or question is directed to Mr. Hatfield. First of all, thank you to Dr. <laughs> or or uh, Councillor Rigger. He took, the, he took the wind out of my sails. I thought I thought I had one question that hadn't been asked, and then he, it was the last question. So I mean, I think a lot of <laughs> I think a lot. Yeah, I was going to say I think a lot of things. Um, have been addressed in terms of traffic where, you know, a lot of, is, is, some of these things aren't going to happen tomorrow. You know, there'll be a, a proper traffic assessment, either a hydrogeological study or it's going to be town water. But again, one of the things that I can't, you know, I've listened to the residents and thank you to all the residents that came and were so impassioned with, um, you know, with your views. Um, you know, I, I feel like changing the, um, the land from residential to commercial is like changing the rules half like after the game started because people have moved here and it was residential and the thing i can't get around is the buffer because the buffer then it talks about the lights and the noise and i guess my question to you is you know what's the appetite to work with the residents to basically you know potentially modify slightly modify maybe pull the development in to create a big enough buffer that some of those issues that have addressed been you know identified like the noise and the lights and you know again even if you have land but there's no trees and you can still see a big you know the side of a big building i mean no one wants that in their backyard um again i'm just wondering if there's any flexibility on that big piece of land um, to kind of modify some things so the residents that moved there and have lived there expecting more residential being built there wouldn't be so bothered by, uh, you know, commercial development. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Luck. I'll come back to you for a follow-up. Uh, Mr. Hatfield. Yeah. To you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Councillor Luck, for the question. Um, if we look at this development, and we, we first started off at a, the original guidelines of the town, which was seven and a half meters, what we first started with. And we proposed the trail to be, I guess, proactive, working with the community to promote um, good health and well-being. We don't have to have a trail. It was just something that we looked at talking, putting in. Um, we went through the PAC. They, uh, they talked about increasing it to, to an additional seven and a half to 15 meters, which is what we currently have on Millennium Drive. Uh, it's a 15 meter buffer there. So in saying that, 
Um, if we look at these homes I and mean, we count them up, there's one, two, three, four, five of them, right up to about the uh, the well, or the pump station, that have anywhere from, I'm going to say, potentially 80 to 150 meters of buffer already, um, just because of the water, the setbacks, and where we're not going to be in that area. So it, definitely, the first four or five homes on the prop or on the uh, on the uh, Monarch Drive are definitely impacted. And yes, I'm definitely more than willing to work with them, whether it is a large berm. You know, the, the second house on there, um, I do believe uh, it's the, uh, the Andersons, they're the ones that are greatly affected um, because of the, the path from MB Power that's cut out and we can't do anything um, in that area. So I'd be, I've talked to them, or I've mentioned to them earlier this year, we talked that, and we talked about it at PAC, I'd be willing to work with them in something on their property as well. Um, to try to mitigate some of this, to help with the situation either way. And I'm willing to work with council and the residents as well um, for any of these properties. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I do have another question directed to Mr. Colburn. Um, because this is, I'm fairly new to this process, I'm wondering in terms of just understanding to make sure that I'm voting <laughs> the right way, um, you know, if, if, potential modifications are happening, what does, you know, do those happen after it's approved, before it's approved, if, you know, like, how does that work so we can make sure that, you know, some of the comments and concerns get addressed? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through Your Worship, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Locke. So the Community Planning Act requires that this process go through what we call three readings of a bylaw amendment. Uh, so you have um, the opportunity to give no more than two readings per council meeting. Okay. So even if you give one and two readings, does it mean that it's actually approved? You have to go through the three readings and then it's subject to obviously the execution of an agreement. So if, if there's questions or more information required, it's council has the authority to give first reading and then uh, ask for more information or bring back potential uh, ways to mitigate some of their concerns that council can entertain. So there's, there's options. You can give first reading and request that. You can give first and second reading and request that, identifying that third reading. Third reading is not given until you have an executed development agreement. So that means that the agreement has been written. Council has an opportunity to review it. The proponent has an opportunity to review it and sign the agreement, so it's executed on the development on the developer's side. So those are the mechanisms that council have if they feel there's more information or they want some options of how these things can be mitigated. They have the ability to give one reading and then part of that motion request additional information to guide them through the remainder of the process. Did you see anything? Go ahead. Um, <laughs> this question is directed again, just to, as a clarifying question. How do we keep um, the right? Like, will the residents have an opportunity if, for example, we we said, well, we'd like to, you know, see some adjustments to, you know, to address perhaps some of the uh, the buffer zones? Would there be an opportunity within that for residents to to also voice their their approval or disapproval at a later date as well, or is this? just in terms of making sure that the residents also have a say in, you know, potential modifications. Who is that directed? That's for Mr. Colbert. Mr. Colbert? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Colbert. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, this is the opportunity for the public to voice their, um, their comments in terms of for and against. Once the public hearing concludes, that is the opportunity at which Counts, uh, the public has their opportunity. So once it's concluded tonight, there is no opportunity for them to come back to council to uh, voice their concerns or their uh, comments. It can be, they can submit, but in terms of a public forum like we have tonight, this is that opportunity. But in terms of the information, in terms of the information, if there's additional information that's provided, obviously that can be made available to the public to review. Um, any additional drawings or modifications can be posted on our website. They're available um, at the town hall. So it has to be open and transparent. Thank you, Mr. Coburn. Good. And Councillor Miller, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I'm sorry. I got, I got two, two last questions. But one is a clarification. I just want to go to Mr. Mr. Colburn. So um, there, 
One of the concerns we have heard many times is about water. Um, I don't think it's going down Monarch anytime soon because we just paved the drive, but I just want to, through your worship to, to Mr. Colburn, that if the water's going to stage two, it does not go down Monarch Drive, it goes directly, and I just want confirmation of that. It doesn't touch Monarch. Thank you, Worship, through you. Uh, that is correct. So we would not see a water line going down Monarch Drive and looping around to get this. It would be the shortest route, point A to point B, across the, arteri uh, across the arterial to service this particular property. Thank you, and you had another one, uh, yeah. Councilor Nolan? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, there's a lot of documents to read and a lot of uh, papers to read as well. Um, I just want to echo a couple of things that, that there's there's a couple of major concerns that you, you've heard and we've all heard. Um, it's about lighting, it's about buffer zones. Um, and I know originally it was, we, we heard the discussion with 15 meters and it changed to seven, now, seven and a half now it's back to 15. Um, you seem to have a very good willingness to comp compromise or work and that's, that's kind of what uh, Councillor Locke was saying about the way this process goes for, for most of you people who haven't, haven't been to one of these before, some will only go first reading and then they die after that because what comes back doesn't, doesn't go any farther. Some will go second reading and die after that and some will go all the way to third reading, but it's all separate steps. So approving one reading doesn't mean it goes to the end, but um, when I look at the, the biggest concerns is about lighting, is about privacy, and I look at the size of the parking lot right there and I'm thinking, I know they're allowing you to do 15, but if you went out 20 or 25 meters, would it make a big difference in your, in your parking lot and, and it would help the other things? And secondly, I, I kind of concur with, uh, this is my personal comment, uh, I concur with Councillor Bigger is, is a trail, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather see the money and have a sidewalk go down part of Monarch than have a trail going through a few people's backyards that, uh, and that's just a personal thing. And, and I think I've heard from the people that are, involved or would be affected by the trail they don't want people just just be able to walk through because that also would cut down more trees if there's trees there which makes the buffer zone and the sound even more so um and i guess that's your willingness and when i look again i'm looking i'm not the builder i sell yogurt for a living so i'm not i don't do this i, I like yogurt too um but the if you move that out not 15 meters but 20 25 meters and and you know, I, I got to go and look again to see how far that is for trees because your building, I believe that's your building you're planning for the first first stage. Um, that would be the closest ones to to the people where everything else, when you get down to whatever you end up putting in there, because I know you've got plans, but what, what happens and what could change over there is significantly far enough away from the majority. I'm just looking at the, the map. Those are all kind of off, off to one side is if that parking lot was in 20, 25 meters, you know, we've always got that issue with the, the buffer that uh, the hydro lines Excuse have taken. Excuse me, Councillor Miller, what there. page are you looking at so that perhaps we can bring them out? Oh, I'm, I'm just looking at the, the renderings, the drawings, where yeah. it shows okay. the, um, so. I'm on, I, there's a whole bunch of pages here, but yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to, yeah. So, can, can I stand up, Your Worship? Yeah, so. Um, so I'm just going to ask uh, Director Perton Dixon to put her mic on so that we can hear you. Oh, I can talk loud. So I can talk loud for a minute. So the um, what what I was trying to say here is right here is seven and a half meters. You double it, there's 15. But if you even went out farther, like this is all kind of a, where you'd be storing, I, I'm assuming some of your vehicles. But if this is your building, which I assume, I think believe you talked about that is if this went out somewhere like to there. And you had all these extra trees. You you help with negate, negating the whether it's lighting, whether it's buffer, and you don't put any trail through there. Like I said, I'd rather see the sidewalk down there. I think most people would. Is then, and that would be. Uh, I would maybe then go for phase one, reading one to see what you're going to come back with. Um, but that that's kind of my 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 question is how far you could go because that's a big concern there. I don't. So the water we know is going to go up there. We know it's not going to come down here. Um, this is the concerned people. This this is the concerned area, the biggest concern. We've got natural resources. We'll take care, help take care of this. But it, this part right here, yeah. ignoring the traffic for a second, the traffic's still a major concern. I'd like to see a new, new, new thing. But this is the one there, and that's 
whether you'd be willing to work with that. that Mr. Hatfield, did you want to respond to that? Certainly, through your worship. Uh, thank you for the question, Councilor Miller. Uh, yes, we would definitely be willing to work with that. And as, as we suggested before, the, the trail doesn't have to be there. It was just more of a, an add-on if the, if the community wanted it. Okay, are there any other questions from Council? Any other questions? There is an opportunity for first reading. Councillor Luck. It's, it's more of a, a process question. So if we do do the reading, do we include some of the things that we would like to see um, perhaps modified or do we just state the standard reading? Yes, Your Worship, the, um, the first reading could also outline some of Council's concerns that could be looked at as part of the negotiation of a developer's agreement, which would be the step required before third and final. Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. Also, like Councillor Luck, this is my first go at, at Council. And so it's a bit of a process question as well, and perhaps it might be on the minds of some of the folks here. But just so I understand, if we proceed, as you're saying, with first reading, maybe with some amendments built in, as you're suggesting, that is to say, please correct me if I'm wrong or clarify for me, that is to say we're willing to further investigate this uh, as part of the process, but as we take into consideration these possible amendments, with no guarantee that this will be approved in the end. Can I understand that? Is that correct? Okay. That's correct. There's no guarantee until third and final. So proceeding with first reading is by no means to be considered giving patent approval to this project. Is that correct? correct? That's correct. Okay. I think that's important for people to understand, for me anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Coburn, not to put you on the spot, did you have anything you wanted to respond to that? Just that I always like to, whether it's it's council or, or PAC or just developers in general, just as council moves through the process, it's important to always go back to the municipal plan and section 4.12 municipal plan outlines the conditions that council takes into consideration when takes the conditions they look at when taking consideration plans. So there's four elements in there and they are one, the site has adequate access to the arterial or collector streets that the site can adequately service by water and sewer service, which we've discussed, that site has sufficient size to meet all the parking, loading, setback, lot coverage, landscaping, and other requirements as set in the zoning bylaw. And number four, that consideration is given to the protection of the adjacent residential development by requiring an acceptable vegetated buffer strip, specifying, specifying the size, type, and location of signing and lighting to be used and any other criteria deemed appropriate by council. So in light of those conditions of the municipal plan, which we use as a guide, council has the authority to say we're giving first reading and so second reading would be subject to obviously the things you wanna outline. So that, that comes in line directly with the municipal plan conditions. Thank you, Mr. Colbert. Are there any other questions? Okay, Councillor Luck. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, it is directed to uh, Mr. Colburn again. Um, you had mentioned that one of them was access to the arterials. So I know that one of the issues that came up is the concern of connecting Finney Drive to that would increase traffic on Mar Monarch. So if that was modified where that didn't happen and it was just an in and a roundabout and oh, you know comes back out, would that still be a feasible? You know, would there be concerns? Um, on some of the things you just said in terms of access? Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you, so the access in terms of what's been proposed, as stated previously, it has to be a minimum of a public street. So that's a requirement in order to get access off the arterial as governed by 
Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. The connection we look at from a subdivision, bylaw, and community planning perspective. Any opportunity where you have where you can provide additional access or connectivity, especially to, to areas or residential areas that only have one access. We look at it for emergency services, alternate routes. We look at it in terms of efficiency of our own maintenance vehicles and uh, providing obviously alternate access out in the event uh, that such is required. So it isn't a requirement to my knowledge based on the information that we have that the connection be made in terms of a requirement from the Department of Transportation. They're looking basically at the style of access, type of access, public street. The connection is with respect to community planning, subdivision guidelines, being able to make additional connections to areas where there's limited access. Again, that would be a decision of council through this process. However, from a planning perspective and subdivision process, and looking at what we've done throughout the community, any opportunity we have to provide alternate access, we do so. Okay. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have a quick, quick question to um, Mr. Colbert. The um, I, I see on the uh, drawing that there is a Pinney Lane extension. Now, is that proposed to be another exit on Pinney Lane to go out Pinney Lane? Through you, Worship. So, the proposal that we have on screen. Um, Sure, if there's an overview. Is there another slide that shows the overall connection? Yeah. So on the site plan here, you have an access that connects Finney Lane to the proposed new street that would ultimately come out to the Arterio. Okay, so I guess my question is. I, I can see where Finney Lane is, and I see Finney Lane extension. So my question is, is it proposed to use Finney Lane as another exit out of this uh, proposed um, development? So the, the connection... So that connection that's proposed would connect Finney Lane to this particular development. So it would be an, it would be an access whereby local traffic or could actually you could basically come out uh, Colton Brook Road through Finney Lane and get access into this development and vice versa. So it would be bi-directional traffic as proposed. That's it. Sure. That's it. That's it. Um, Okay, so so Finney Lane only goes one place. It it goes to the Coltonbrook Road, which in turn goes to Monarch. So the the it's really not another exit, you know, like it's still going to the same place. It's still coming out Monarch Drive. I guess I, I, guess I would. That um, proposed exit. No, the, the connection, like the connection would be, as Finney Lane exists today, you can come out Finney Lane and you go Colton Brook out to Monarch to get to Route 119. If this were to move forward and that connection was made with Finney Lane, your access to the arterial could be through this proposed development. So you could actually come out Finney Lane, go through the new development, and then get to the arterial that way and vice versa, right? So you're still not restricted in terms of Finney Lane in that particular area you would not necessarily always have to go to Monarch. If this were to get developed, you could come out, use Finney Lane, come through this development to get to the arterial as well. I, I'm, I'm just a little confused. So what you're saying is 
the arterial where it's closed off right now, like a, as you go out the Colton Brook and out to the end, and are you talking of that arterial, opening that up at that end? No. Through no through you or something. The only the only connection that's proposed in this particular development is with Route 119 arterial. There's no extension in terms of Colton Brook or Ashfield to to the Mackay Highway or anything of that sort. It's basically just this particular connection to Route 119. One one quick, <laughs> just one quick comment. Um, so prior to the um, arterial joining up with the at, uh, at Route 119, the arterial. So prior to that being developed, because as you said, there has to be certain conditions met. So the traffic is coming, or the the. The right away will be coming off Monarch to to develop to start the development in there. Is that so? Through you, worship phase one will be off of Route One Nineteen. Right, there will be even with phase one that initial the initial two buildings that you see closest to the air, that, that access will be off Route 119. There will be no, at this point in time, there will be no access through Monarch, Colton Brook, through Finney to develop the land. All development will start in terms of access from Route 119. So you're going from Route 119 inwards, right? And then the connection, if it were to take place, would happen in a subsequent phase, potentially phase two. Are you clear with that now? Thank you. Any other questions from council? There's an opportunity for first and or second reading. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. I would move we give first reading, uh, first reading be given to Municipal Plan Bylaw Amendment number 054-03, designated PID number 250217 and PID number 173765 from residential to commercial. Thank you, Councillor Olson. It's been moved by Councillor Olson. Is there a seconder? Councillor Miller. I was just seconding for, for first reading based having uh, Mr. Hatfield come back with uh, new plans based on the, the um, concerns from the residents and from council so we can take a second look at, uh, at what, he, what he has to bring. Thank you, Councillor Miller. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Miller on the question. Seeing that there are none, please vote now. Could we, would, would you like them to repeat the motion? So the motion started with Councillor Olson and I believe you added, Councillor Miller, that you wanted the items addressed that were brought up from Council and, yes, okay. Your Worship, Councillor Donovan had a question on the question. Thank you, Councillor Don Donovan, on the question. Thank you, that was actually my question, was whether or not the reading was going to be staying the same or if um, Councillor Miller's points were going to be added into that, because I, I do agree with um, what he had said and, and uh, what others have said about um, having Mr. Hatfield come back with a, a, you know, a, a modified set of plans. So if somebody could clarify 
um, that for me before I, I cast my vote. That would be great. Thank you. Plans based on your buffer requirement? Was it the buffer or were there additional items? That we've heard tonight, right? So it's, I can go through lights and buffer and and setbacks and all those other things, but uh, Mr. Hatfield has heard them and, and so has council. Um, so, I mean, this is this is not something that uh, he just put on a piece of paper. It's got, he's put a lot of time and effort in it and so is, so is the, uh, the public to come and see this. So, um, and Mr. Hatfield, in my opinion, has showed that he would work towards trying to make it uh, acceptable for lack of a better word. Uh, and so I'd like to give him a shot at coming back to, to seeing what it is. So that's, that was, that's my comment on that, yeah. Thank you, so the motion is as it stood, however, with the addition of addressing the issues that were brought up both by the residents and by council. On the question, Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, I also just want to say that I, I think that I, I, I can get behind this as an investigator, a part of the investigative process about the potential viability in the long term, given the things that Councillor Miller and others have brought up. And I, for, I take note, for example, that some of the concerns, I think, have been dispelled by virtue of what we've said about uh, things such as where will you know, where would municipal water go uh, in phase two development? And would residents be on the hook? Well, we're not talking, as I understand it from what I've heard tonight, we're not talking about forcing municipal water down Monarch Drive on anybody. Uh, I stand to be corrected if that's not right, but that's what I'm taking. No, no, certainly not. No, no, certainly not. But I'm... I, Please give Councillor Bigger an opportunity to speak. You've had an opportunity to speak. We've heard your concerns. If you're going to speak out of turn, I'll ask you to leave. I'm sorry, but we have to keep control here. We have to be considerate of the people that have come here tonight to make their points, and we also have to be considerate of council. Thank you. I do appreciate it. I know how difficult this is for you. I'm, I want to give Mr. Bigger, Councillor Bigger, the opportunity to say his piece. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, as Councillor uh, as Councillor Miller has pointed out, um, the process uh, the process necessitates that we continue to uh, hear what you have to say going forward. As as the town planner has pointed out, uh, on the one hand. A public forum such as this it happens tonight, and then you know we investigate the viability of it in all of the ways that it applies, and that includes, from my perspective anyway, I'll only speak for myself. I can't speak for everyone else, but that continues to include the sentiment of just being generally opposed from a quality of life perspective to a large commercial development being in proximity to your, you know, houses. So that's not lost on me, and I trust in the integrity and the insight of the people around the horseshoe, so I expect it's not lost on anyone else. Uh, that's why, and perhaps as a newbie, I'll say, compared to some people who've been here before, that's why I'm trying to just really understand the, the sort of tentative nature of giving sort of way to the, the process of, of investigating this. And you know, trying to be a responsible steward of both the sentiment for general development that benefits the town overall, but the very keen, acute concerns that are expressed by you. You're, it's a large group of people here tonight. I mean, that's, uh, I won't say it's overwhelming, but it's compelling to, to take note of. So it's not lost on me. And, uh, uh, but I, I just am trying to appreciate the sort of the process uh, and, uh, I would, I would really, I would just really warn anybody, or try, I, that's not the right way to say it. I would try to assuage your concern to think that if first reading proceeds based on the, the, the caveats that we're discussing here, that that means that you guys are SOL. Uh, that's not how I see it, one, not one little bit. I, you know, if this is no good for the community, then it's no good for the community. 
uh, and uh, you're welcome to continue to be in contact with me and I expect other councillors and the mayor would feel the same and the town. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to speak with anyone about their concerns directly. But uh, so please don't take my uh, willingness to proceed with, you know, sort of, I won't call it the democratic process. That's perhaps a bit kind of vast for what's going on here, but please don't mistake that for uh, an absence of concern about what you're bringing forward tonight. It's, it's, you know, it's made a real impact on me. And I've written down the names of everybody who spoke the point form concerns that were raised by everybody. I've reviewed all of the emails that came in, and that's before us probably as much or more than anything else as we go forward with this. It's just about, I think, uh, again, I'll, I'll be quiet here, but I'll just say that from my perspective, I think it's about trying to just investigate the potential to find some kind of uh, you know, capacity for coexistence. If there isn't any, that, that adequately satisfies the concerns of the town, uh, then we'll, then it can't go forward. I mean, it's, very, it's entirely likely that it can't go forward. Uh, there's no guarantee of anything at this point. So anyway, I don't expect people to be happy with anything I'm saying right now, but I'll just leave it at that. So. Thank you, Councillor Bigger. There's a motion on the table. Please vote now. Motion carried, 5-1, with a nay from Councillor Thompson. Thompson. And did we have, okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, residents, certainly. I, I do appreciate it, and I appreciate that the decorum that we must keep. So I, I know that that's challenging sometimes, but thank you for being here this evening and expressing your concerns. I'd like to ask for a motion for a five-moment uh, health break, please. Moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Luck. All those in favor? Five moment health break, please. Motion carried.
Okay, with councils available. We're just waiting on a couple more people. Once I let them go, it's like herding mosquitoes in a tent. Yep. What's that? Okay. I'd like to call everyone to order. I'd like to call everyone to order, please. We are on item number. Give me a second. Item number six B. Correct. This is uh, from February fifteenth, twenty twenty-two. KV Custom Homes Rezoning Application Proposed Zoning Bylaw Amendment Number 034-35, Residential R1, Single and Two-Family to Residential R3, Terrace Dwellings. Property identified as 124 Pettingill Road, PID Number 302-162, or sorry, 16527, and PID Number 0025-1694. In attendance this evening, we have the proponent, Mr. Andrew McIntyre. So once again, I'm going to go through the public hearing process. So we've been asked this evening and plan to consider the amending of zoning bylaw number 38, I think it is. Are we doing both um, municipal and... Zoning. No, just the zoning. Just the zoning. So today has been set for this public hearing, which is which brings you here this evening. I will ask for the proponents to speak, and then I will ask anyone for for or against to speak. And you'll have an opportunity to that to do that uh, in five minute intervals. So good evening, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, you may begin your presentation. Good evening, everyone. Um, so to start, just give you a little layout. I know everybody's seen the package that we've put out. So we've got a 12 acre piece of land. It's right in the middle of Quiz Pam says. So we've got a nice under underdeveloped piece of land that we're looking to bring back into the community. Um, we're looking to develop an age friendly neighborhood that adapts its structures and its landscaping to make it uh, inclusive for an aging population. The neighborhood we're looking to create, it's, it'll be a quiet retirement neighborhood. That's the demographic we're looking for. Um, we're looking to create a community within a community. Chris Pam says is a beautiful area. So we wanna take this area and bring it into Chris Pam and create the kind of development we need around here. Um, we're looking for one that's warm and inviting, full of trees, privacy, uh, we're gonna we would like to put trails to access the existing trail system We want to make our roads narrower 
put some squeeze points in to, to limit the speed and the amount of traffic coming through the area. We want to build something different. We want to bring things that are in line with the Chris Pam Sys development plan. Um, in a broader sense, we're looking to develop the way that we should be developing now. Many things are just getting, like we have a beautiful tree lot. We want to leave the trees. Trees to us are very important. So we want to smaller roads and keep as much buffer as we absolutely can around all our neighbor, neighbors. We got one of the oldest around here. We have the oldest population in Canada. So we need to look after them. Um, we have a strong belief that development and nature can work together. So I have a background in environmental, so I understand concerns that are going to be brought up about Ritchie Lake, uh, silt, all these things are extremely important. What's going to make this project in, the, in this area beautiful are the trees, the view of Ritchie Lake, which we want as Ritchie Lake. We don't want to add anything to it. Um, so I've read through in a few of the concerns that I've seen. One has been the water in the area. We can't move ahead with anything until we do a water study. So to get through phase one, we will be doing a water study to determine we have the proper amount of water for what we, what we, we would like to build. Um, Another big one has been traffic. We're working with the town. The Kensington, Inter the Kensington intersection at this point, it needs a little help just because of the school. So we would, we're looking to work with the town, do a traffic study, determine what we may introduce and what can be done to correct the issues that are already at that point. So we think we could make this better than it already is, even by introducing a little bit of traffic. Uh, green space has been a, a big concern, and it's a big concern of ours. One of the big reasons we like this property, we've looked at many properties. This property has all the greenery that we want to create the type of community we want to create. So I went through a little bit, and in this property with the proposed development that you've seen, we've got approximately 14% would be the roads, because we're, we're bringing them down our homes would only take up about 14%. We've got a total green space. We have LPP, we've got about 12.5%. Trails would be approximately 1%. Then we have terrace and green space. So that's gonna, it would be owned by the terrace community, a 17%. So that brings us to a total of 30.5% green space. But that doesn't include lawns or driveways. We're gonna have narrow driveways, that's approximately another 41%. So for us, the importance is greenery. We want gardens, we want trees, and we want grass. We don't want pavement, we don't want big cleared areas, I don't want to clear cut the trees. We want, if you were to drive in, drive down Pettingo, we don't even want you to see in there the best we can. We'd like all that tree buffer to stay around all the existing properties, keep the trees, as many as we absolutely can. So that uh, hopefully gives you a, a light idea of what we're looking to do, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. This isn't the point where we would address questions to you, uh, but I will ask you to be seated, and I'll ask anyone wishing to speak for or against to please come to the podium and give your name. Anyone wishing to speak for or against Welcome. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my name is Doug Evans. This is my beautiful wife, Amanda. She's just making sure I cover all the points that she's already drafted for me to say. Um, I live in the Kingston Peninsula. I have five acres of land on the St. John River. I have a beautiful home. And the uh, upshot is that we want to downsize, but we want quality for quality. And so my, my purpose here is to preach this and hopefully people will buy what I'm saying. Uh, 13 years ago, we bought a property on the Kingston Peninsula, as I said, five acres. We wanted to build a house there. Uh, my prospective son-in-law was gonna get married at, to my daughter. He's a builder. 
very well-known builder in the area. And so the deal was, if I was going to pay for this wedding, he's going to build me a quality home. And thankfully, he did build me this quality home, and he got married, and now they have two kids, and they live in the area, and everything's great. And we love the home. We love where we live. We love our neighbors. We love everything about it, except that it requires a lot of maintenance, uh, and you can't just walk away and leave it for a period of time because it's, it's rural. A few years ago, uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer. My wife's a lawyer. I, I semi-retired. We want to live life a little more to the fullest. We want to take more time, travel, go to some warm climates in the wintertime, like everybody else, I guess. And so we're looking for a spot where we can uh, downsize, yet have the quality to which we're accustomed, and live out our life with good neighbors. So we, I talked to our, so we talked to our son-in-law, and uh, he told us about Andrew McIntyre and that he knew Andrew was a good builder, very competent builder, and recommended that we talk to him. And we did talk to him. And uh, we were satisfied that what he was putting forward was something that we were interested in. That is quality home building. And that we would have less maintenance with this type of property, that we would have a secure property, and that we could just walk away for a period of time and because of the way the property was going to be managed, we wouldn't have to worry about security. Uh, so we entered into discussions with Andrew, and uh, we also we were interested in water, first thing being on the peninsula, of course, and traffic because we don't have any on the peninsula. And so we talked to him about this, and he advised that he was going to have a traffic study and a water study done. So then we went to PAC. And we went to the last meeting and uh, heard what was said there. And I must say, I was very impressed with the, the type of questioning, the type of material presented, and the fact that uh, PAC is uh, recommending a water study, a, store, a storm sewage study, and a traffic study to you as part of this agreement, if there is one, which is exactly what we would want anyway. When we were looking for a place to downsize, we talked to a number of people, we talked to realtors, we researched, and there just ain't anything out there, as you probably know, like this. Uh, so this drew us to this development as well, because it gives us a chance to downsize as we want to, live with like-minded people, and enjoy ourselves. I think that this type of development is also not only in keeping with the town of Quispam says, but is forward thinking for you because there isn't anything else out there like this. This will draw people like us to your community and become citizens of your community, whereas other, we might not otherwise have, have thought about doing so. And so for this reason, for all these reasons, I would strongly suggest that uh, and hope that you approve this development uh, and I hope I've covered all the questions. There's a thumbs up there, so I guess I'm okay. Uh, if anybody does have any questions of me, I'd certainly be willing to answer any. I know this isn't the forum for it, but I thank you very much for having me here tonight, and I appreciate it. Kathy, thank you for directing us in the right, proper way to do it, too. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. I will ask three times. If there is anyone, please state your name for the clerk. Gary Hall. I'm wondering if you could take that one up on up on the screen. It just says proposed new terrorist courts development. That might be that one might be a good enough. No, I would need one that shows more of the area. Just bear with us there a moment. You're getting there. It's close, close yeah. to that one. Yeah. Just show them your picture there again. Just so. Oh, 
Don't worry about it then. Yeah. If you could tell us the page, I'll make sure that everyone brings that up on their package. Oh. I got that in the mail. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Letter. Okay. And anyway, so it's... Um, I am going to restart the timer because... <laughs> That's okay. If I take more go. than five minutes, I'm going to... All right, you begin speaking. Okay. The, um, I'm glad to hear about the water studies and the traffic studies and the drainage and things like that because those were a lot of the concerns that I had as well too. Um, but when I look at this picture here on, onto it, um, I'm seeing the existing driveway that goes into the property right now. So it's not the new extension coming off of... Uh, Kensington or anything like that. But I'm seeing that driveway is not a part of this. Um, and the reason I'm concerned about that is I didn't want to see how much traffic might be going in there because I'm directly across the street from it. But I see that it joins in what I'm assuming is Heritage Way because I can't see any street name on the side. Okay. And I was just wondering how they were going to be doing that because I think those are all other lots that are in there that aren't part of the subdivision plan that's showing here. So that's, that, that was just a concern that I had based on everything else being said tonight already around water studies and sewer uh, drain off and, and uh, traffic studies and stuff like that. So that's like I said, it wasn't going to take the full five minutes just for those questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Okay. Hall. No, we're, we're going to ask first if there's anyone else who would like to speak for or against. Questions will be answered at the end. Could you Hello, please give us your uh, name? Julian Watts, Your Worship and Councillors. Thank you. Um, what was your name again, please? Sorry? What was your name? Julian Watts. Thank you. My main concern is around the uh, water. And we've heard that uh, there's going to be a study. Now, who's doing this study? Is this the responsibility of the developer? Um, and who's checking it, who's paying for it, etc. Right. So I just want to ensure this impartiality there. Um, also heard... Councillor Olson mentioned with the uh, development uh, earlier that uh, uh, that we're going to partner with developers to get town water laid on. Is this the case in this particular development? Are we going to have town water running up Pettingill to this development? Sir, this evening you can express question, your concerns. Uh, this is a question I'm putting out there. Yeah. Um, so these are my concerns. Uh, another concern, this is more for council really and planning, when was the last hydrographic survey done and, and the aquifier looked at? What climate change modelling are you applying to this um, and also the amount of development that's been going on in Quiz Pamsis? So these are the kind of concerns that I have. Like I've, I've lived here five years and I've seen a lot of change. Uh, I moved here because it's quiet, right? I hoped. Things are changing. I understand the need for development. Um, also, uh, just some little comments. I hope the irony wasn't lost on you that this is a subdivision for old people and the other guy was trying to keep the young people here. And um, we seem kind of... I'm, I'm not in that young people age group. Um, and uh, also, narrow roads, Mr McIntyre, narrow roads. Um, I've seen this in other developments in another province I lived in. Uh, there's nowhere to put the snow... Just a little concern, Mr. Planning Guy. And also, um, as I get older, I need wider things, you know, to aim at, right? I'm not so good as I used to be when I was younger. So just some little points for the developer there. But big concern over the water. And um, I need some reassurances that this is going to work out proper and right. Okay? I'm concerned about how this uh, survey is going to be done who's going to do it, and the impartiality of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Waltz. Anyone else wishing to speak for or against? Welcome. Uh, John Kelly is my name on the Pettengill Road. And uh, I guess just a few comments further to Julian's, if I could. And, um, and there again, again around the, the, the water issue. Uh, I've lived uh, in my home here for 50 years, and I remember when the first year I was there and built, built the house, I, I put in a septic tank, and it was a, a year afterwards that they put in the town sewerage. 
and I had uh, seemingly no knowledge of that, so I've got a brand new septic tank in my yard and I'm interested in it. <laughs> anyway, my point being, of course, is, uh, and I'd, I'd like to make this maybe a, a long-range comment, I guess, if you will, is that it always seems to me that, you know, before we, you know, go into uh, approving uh, new development, that we need to have the infrastructure in place to, uh, to, to do that first rather than afterwards. And it just seems to me that, um, you know, uh, we're getting a lot of development there. Uh, I live in, we're living on the Pettengill Road. It's badly beaten up. Uh, it lacks traffic control. Um, again, it just seems to me, and in the, in the point that needs to be addressed perhaps is that, you know, what is the long range of uh, in infrastructure concerns that are going to be addressed? You know, is it going to be five years down the road that we're going to have to have water come down the Pettengill Road after, after this happens or more development? And, uh, of course, then that, that impacts us as, as residents of, you know, putting in new infrastructure personally, too. So some of my concerns, I guess, and I'll leave that to, uh, to Council. And, and maybe I guess that he, if I could put uh, Councillor Olson there and the point is, you know, and he made it earlier in this other presentation that, you know, this, this whole thing around water is that, you know, we're, we're behind the eight ball with water. And um, every time we go through these here particular initiatives, uh, we get, uh, we get uh, further and further into that situation. And it just seems to me that the uh, thing needs to be addressed now rather than later. And then it causes further complications for us as individual citizens of the, of the, of the town. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Is there anyone else wishing to speak for or against? Welcome. Good evening, Your Worship. Good evening. Bayshore, I lived over there. Okay, right on. Yeah. Yeah. Please give your name for the clerk. My name is Jerry Wallace. Wallace? Wallace, yes. And I live at 118 Pettingill Road. And I've been there for 50 years, and John is my neighbor. So um, we wrote a letter to the town. And uh, if my cataracts will let me read it, I will. Because I, you know, I'm. I don't know if these people have a copy of it or not, but they, those letters were all in our packages. Yeah. Well, I'm. I think that I'm going to be the most affected with this subdivision going in behind me, because I'm just right next to Kensington Avenue, and um, it's just. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, it's just too, too close to me. Uh, there's a three meter buffer, which is literally nothing, you know, nine feet. So uh, that that can be a problem for me, and also traffic. Um, You've got the subdivision down uh, at, behind St. Augustine's Church and its building, and put another 45 on top of that. It's just, you know, I mean, I was four minutes getting out of my driveway tonight at, at five to seven. Four minutes I sat there at, you know, at the end of my driveway. And, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty well standard, four or five minutes. Unless I go, when, you know, two o'clock in the morning or Eleven o'clock at night or something. The traffic starts there it's at uh, eleven o'clock. So uh, I do have some more con more concerns, but uh, I I'm just looking at my letter here. I'm, I'm just hoping that, you know, if, if that does go and the water's good and, and everything's fine, I just, you know, I, I just don't think that Pettingill Road can take much more 
traffic than what's what than what's happening right now. I mean, it's it's just crazy. You know? I mean, people come. In, you think you? I live at just by Kensington, and you think you see cars coming down the top of the hill, and next thing you know, there's ten cars coming from probably from the peninsula, and you know, and then they're coming the other way, and you 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 you're just stuck there, literally, you know. So and the traffic, you know, it's it's just it's just for me, it's just too much. So I'm against it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wallace. Is there anyone else wishing to speak for or against the proponents project? I'll ask two more times. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against? Is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against? We've heard the issues and concerns that have been brought forth. What I will do now is ask the proponent to come back and give his summation. Then I will give an opportunity for counsel to ask questions of the development officer and of Mr. McIntyre. Welcome back, Mr. McIntyre. Thank you. Um, the concerns that have been raised are all ones that we worry about as well. And one, we've just heard about the traffic, and that's where, like I said, we'll work with the town. Pettingale is a busy road, but it's a collector road. That's the road that keeps everybody out of the subdivisions. Um, so if we can work with the town to, to clean that up a little bit, you know, and, and, and just make it a safer area, easier for people to get out of their driveways, that would be great. Um, respect to green space and water, we already know about the water study. Green space we're big on. And you had mentioned you need, you need more room, you need bigger things. Well, the way we're looking at these homes, we're calling them, they're visitable homes. It's, it's a, we'll call it a trend, but it's, it's kind of how we should be building now. We're gonna build, we put bigger, bigger, bigger hallways, wider doors. Um, we try for no step entries, right? So right now, if you're 50, if you're 60, it doesn't matter how old, you're great. But if something happens, or even if you just hurt, or break your leg, you can possibly get in your home a lot easier. You could have friends come over and visit. So we're oriented, we're trying to make these homes for everybody for as long as they possibly can. Um, yeah, and if there's any uh, questions or concerns, I'd love to answer them. Um, I know that various speakers did have concerns about the hydrogeological study, the runoff, the road, uh, yeah. wider roads, narrower roads. Um, and infrastructure, long-range uh, infrastructure. So if they feel that those those answers have come forth. Yeah, with with the narrower roads, it right now we got 20 meter. We'd like to get ours down to possibly 16 if we can. We're putting, we want to put a walking trail down that gets everybody off the roads. Um, as far as infrastructure, we're going to have a drainage plan. We're going to look at, we'll mitigate all the issues to ensure that nothing goes to Ritchie Lake. If I gotta put up 200 hay bales to keep everything, and if we have to add extra, and I've heard concerns about garbage. If you talk to people that we built for, we're very, we clean every day. We're very clean on our work sites. You can come by any of my work sites and you'll see they're always clean. We don't let things blow around. If they do blow around and I miss a piece, you call me on my cell, I'll come get it right away. We don't believe in that. We don't, you shouldn't drive down your road and see stuff blown around. You shouldn't see Tyvek in your ditch. Our rock, like if, if there's rocks, they shouldn't roll out of the trail. That shouldn't be there. Like those are the things we need to take care of, and that's how we build responsibly around here. And I think if we, we all put our heads together, work together, I think we can make a lot of good things happen around here. And we're open to anything we need to do to make this what, what Quiz Pam says needs. So I think that's it. Thank you. Just going to leave the seat for a moment, Deputy Mayor, if you don't mind. Uh, when you speak of narrowing the roads, yep. have you spoken with the uh, fire chief to determine whether or not fire trucks can make access? We've got the roads laid out that they are of the proper width. I've spoken with the town 
um, regarding these issues. Um, it's something to be looked at. It was, I won't say it was uh, approved, but we did talk about it and about bringing them down a little bit from the, the 20 meter speedways to get them down into the you know, 18, 16 meter wide. Still lots of room for your cars, fire trucks can get in. The way we've got our turnaround up at the top of the cul-de-sac in the existing driveway, we can get in there. That's for snow storage. We've, uh, we've tried to cover all the points to ensure that everything is where we need, especially with that extra trail off to the side, full trail running through. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I will go to questions now from Council. Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. McIntyre, for your presentation and for coming back to answer questions. Thank you very much to everybody who's here, who's spoken as well, and for being patient uh, to uh, hang in there. Uh, it's a late night for sure. Um, I was listening to Mr. Wallace's concern about a three meter buffer, and uh, I that I was a bit taken aback by that. I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the graphic. It's a night of figuring out the graphics. In the in the council package, it's item seven under six uh, B one under custom homes. Exactly that one. I don't know if that's something that you could bring up on. It's the very last item under the uh, developer's proposal. Um, it's the one that's sort of a, a blueprint. Oh, thank you. I think that's it. Exact. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. So uh, as you come along Pettengill, uh, sort of moving in this image from lower left to upper right, I can see those three properties that kind of indent into the sort of proposed, you know, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Uh, these are the properties that sit with a three meter buffer as it's proposed here. Is that about right? Can, can you just speak to that a bit? Because that seems terribly inadequate to uh, just as a... That's very small. That is, and we'll say the, uh, the minimum you're allowed. Exactly. And that's not what we're looking to do. So what we want to do is down Pettingo Road, we don't want those trees gone. We want all those staying. Obviously, we have to clear a little bit by the houses, but we don't want any of those gone. And down in, in around all of those properties, what we want to do is just create behind those homes, there'll be a deck and just a nice, like just a nice grass area, not a massive, everything else stays. And when you come back around again and you see how big those other backyards are, same thing, nice small backyard, all the trees stay. We're, we want to maximize the trees, right? So when that was laid out and, and Fundia put that package together, it's the minimum, minimum requirements, but we're looking to exceed all of them. We're, so. Okay, thank you. And just a, a, one quick follow-up. Uh, I sort of pontificated in the last session, so I won't do that this time, but. Okay, so further to that, um, Mr. McIntyre, looking at the proposed lots of your development that are closest to those existing uh, uh, properties. So for example, lots one through three, and then 27 through all the way to 32, and then maybe up the around the corner from that, maybe 40 and 39, or maybe 40. I know these are generally three unit kind of developments. There is one two unit development down in the lower left corner there, but so what, I don't know if this is a fair question to ask, but I can't help but you know wonder is it maybe not viable to develop that area, you know, uh, as to as a way to address the concern of the resident or residents. Uh, and so I don't know. I, I mean, I hear what you're saying for sure about wanting to exceed. You seem to be very clear about that, and uh, I take your word on that. But I just, I just, you know. Perhaps I'm just bringing that up as something for us to consider uh, as we as we ponder kind of this development. But um, just generally speaking, I, I certainly can understand why anyone would be concerned if they thought they were only going to have, you know, nine or ten feet and then a thin layer of trees and then kind of someone's barbecue, you know. So I'll just point that out. But uh, that's... And I, and I understand that. And that's why we want... Like I said, I, you know, I've, I've obviously said it, but we don't want to cut our trees down. 
And that's why a few people ask me, well, why didn't have you even try putting the road in it? And I said, I want cutting trees down, I don't need to. We'll wait for, hopefully, to get approval, we'll slide a nice little road through, and then we'll cut our openings. And the only trees that gotta come down are enough to make a little grass there, because nobody, would, like it's gonna be a, a terrace community, which means your snow, your lawn care, and your well are all taken care of. So people aren't looking for big yards, they're looking for nice, clean yards, and the people in my mind that would be buying these don't want to look out their back door. And I don't want to, I may like you, but I don't want to stare at you all the time if I'm on my back deck. So that's what we're trying to create in here is all that privacy. And if I own, was any of those three in the front, I want the same thing. We have some trees on theirs, we're going to maximize the trees on ours. And that's in, around the entire property. The whole bottom section we aren't touching. They can, you can see the, the open areas. If we can leave them, they're all staying. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Bigger. <laughs> Councillor Thompson, please. Oh, sorry. Oops. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for your presentation and update, and uh, for everybody that's here tonight. Um, my question, um, uh, one of the questions was regarding the entrance on Heritage Way um, and what was happening to the existing entrance on the Pettingale. So if you can elaborate on that for the people in the audience. Yep. It's set is you would come in by Kensington, and you would head out the road at Heritage. The existing driveway would no longer be used, and maybe Dwight could speak better to it, but there was issues with sight lines up to Heritage, and there was issues with a, a property across the street. It has two entrances, one on each side of that existing driveway. So if we were to use that, well, we've just limited that other property from being developed. So between that and sight lines, it was the town's suggestion that this is how we ran our roads through. Uh, so um, a follow-up question from um, to um, um, planning um, Dwight Colburn. Uh, so the entrance on Heritage Way, is that something that we would develop immediately or is that something that would come in the second or third stage? Thank you, Your Worship. Through Your Worship, so the proposed development is to be done in multiple phases. At this stage, it's proposed it would be three phases, with the initial access coming off of Pettengill Road at the Kensington entrance. So you would see that entrance, the, the final probably connection made in the final phase of the development. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Miller. Thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you for your presentation and, and thank you for the letters and the con comments as well from, from everybody here. Um, I'm just going to do a quick statement first and I'm going to ask a question. There's there was a lot of or a few questions on water. So just so you know, um, and half a council won't be aware or may not be aware because they weren't here a few years ago. But we did a study on putting uh, what it would cost to put town water in for the whole community. It's about $74 million. Um, and right now, the current where the current aquifer is, that is all, that could do this side of the railway tracks, but not where we're talking about now, where, where I live. So it will be a while before you get town water there. So probably you'd have to put another aquifer up by Squire somewhere to gravity fed. But they've done all the, and, and maybe the if, if Mr. Colburn wants to talk more about it, but they've done the, the studies on where all the aquifers are, and that was part, that was like two, three years ago, so we know where all the water is and, and how deep it is as well. Um, so that's just kind of a comment on water, because I, I don't think we'll have town water. I live over that way too. You won't have town water for a while. Um, my question is is kind of a tag along to uh, uh, Councillor Bigger uh, and to the, uh, the gentleman, sorry, uh, Mr. Wallace, because uh, that's right behind his house, lot 2728. Um, I guess the question is, we're trying to keep as many trees. I look across the street, they're a, lot, they're a bit closer to the road roadway or the walkway than, than the ones, than 27 to 20, 27, 29, are a bit farther away from the roadway, at least by this rendering, than, than the ones across the road. 
Yeah. Yeah. But it's in the easement. So there'd be a trail coming right off Kensington or not across from Kensington all the way around, all the way out to Heritage. Yes. And there's another trail that would go up the inside of that road heading back out the existing driveway. Okay. So that's kind of what's making that picture look a little off. Okay. Because I, I was wondering, even if you move those ahead, like, Another three or four feet that just gives you the more trees in the background. No, oh, and 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 that's what we want. Like, so we do, we don't want. Well, we have limits of what we're allowed to do, right? Yeah. As far as code wise, so we want them pushed forward to create the buffers. Yeah. Okay. Like so. And. But. Okay. No. Perfect. That and and the other question is is just more of a clarification. When you do the water study, I mean, you have to hire a consulting yep. firm to yep. do yep. all the we hire water an engineering studies. firm and. It's all on And that. that gets passed through through your worship to our uh, planning officer. Those all have to be approved by, by the town as well, as far as the, the flows and stuff like that. And it's and it looks like, anyways, you're going to have, the flows have to support two to three homes when I looked at the, 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 the flow, like, so when we do the first test, there's 14 units, like 14 single units. So it has to be able to support those 14 units. And the way it's set out and the way It'd be like kind of the way Wellington Court set out. The way the town wanted that one was one per unit. If you get a great well, maybe you could do two units, but it all comes down to first your flow for the full phase, then the flow per well, right? If, if I can feed three, then that's great. If I could fill, fit two buildings, which would be six units, that's great. But it all is going to come down to every individual well. But first, it's making sure we actually can support the development. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Councillor Olson, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Mr. McIntyre, for your presentation. I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised to hear about uh, saving trees. Trees and because unfortunately, we we see some developers going and clear cut their whole property, and uh, and I I don't really agree with that, and. Uh, those trees are <coughs> probably 50, 60 years old or older, mm -hmm. and uh, they, you can't replace them overnight. And even if you promise to put in a buffer zone or add to a buffer zone with uh, 10 or 15 foot trees, which are quite expensive, it takes time for them to grow. So I think it's uh, important to protect uh, natural growth. Um, as far as the water goes, uh, I know uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Miller, uh, uh, very astutely uh, uh, put it in proper perspective. Uh, you know, we uh, we have Pettingill, we have uh, water on the Hampton Road down to uh, uh, Pinewood, and that's about it. And we've just been doing it in phases. And uh, as some people have said, even when we pass a house that uh, it has water in front of it, people don't want to tie, uh, hook into it. And uh, over over the years, I was on water committees, uh, represent for the town, and uh, meeting down at Rossley High School, and uh, with with the valley and everything, and we were talking about bringing out treated water from St. John, and we were bringing it out the Block Loman Road, down the air, down the uh, Airport Expressway, and then back down to St. John, uh, along the railway tracks, you know, so that you could you could feed it, you know, from both ends. Back then it was 65 million. It's probably 200 million now, you know. So it's not something that that takes care of itself. It's something that it's eventually somebody's going to have to bite the bullet to put it in. And when you can get a developer that's going to cost share you with you in a certain system, that's when you try to take advantage of it if you can. But uh, uh, saying that, uh, I, I realize that uh, Pettinga Road is a very busy street. Uh, we've got a lot of development on there, a lot of high traffic development uh, facilities, and um, I guess we're going to have to uh, uh, try to address that as uh, much as possible. Um, the, the road is up for, I think, major uh, repair and reconstruction uh, in the near future. I'm not saying it's budgeted right now, but it's something that we have to look at seriously. But uh, we have sidewalks there, which is which is a good thing. But uh, anyway, I, I uh, I'm interested in hearing the uh, comments of council on on the development. It looks interesting. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Olson. I'm going next to Councillor Luck, but I'd like to ask if Councillor Donovan, is he asking for? I was asking, but Councillor Luck went first, so I can yes. wait. Yes, yes, uh, Councillor Luck was. <laughs> Councillor Donovan, she said she's happy to let you go first. Oh, tell her I said thank you, or I'm sure she can hear me. <laughs> But my question is, um, with the smaller or you know skinnier um, roads that are going to be in this area, is there going to be like enough room for sidewalks? And you know, if there are, is that something that you know the town is responsible for putting in, or is that something that the developer is going to going to be putting in as part of his you know project? Because I, he it it's a fifty and up you know, project, and I'm sure a lot of those people enjoy walking and mentioned trails, but it would it would be nice to have some sidewalks there too, because I know they're a heavily requested and fairly expensive item. So that's all. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Would you like to address that? Yep. Uh, so there will be pathways going right out from where we come in off Kensington all the way around the lower side of the property, all the way back out to Heritage. And there'll be another pathway running up to the, the cul-de-sac. And then you can see two more pathways coming down to access the trail. And they'll be coming directly off, the, they would be coming directly off the new pathway. So there you have, everybody would have access and a nice little walkway to go on. Thank you. I will move forward. <coughs> Did he have a, a second question, a follow-up that you can see? No. Okay. Now, we'll go to Councillor Locke. Thank you, Councillor Locke, for your patience. No problem. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I guess before I ask my questions, one of the questions Mr. Hall had, and I'm wondering while this picture is up, if you could just explain, I, I think his question was how this whole uh, new development was going to connect to Heritage Way. So I'm just wondering if you could point that out just so, because I know that that was something that he had brought up, so I'm wondering while the picture's up, if you could just explain that so he has his answer. Yep, so it would, well, it's going to come down in Kensington, and then it runs straight across. And then on Heritage, there's no name on the street, but when you first come in, there's that little stubbed out road there, so that's where we would be connecting right into. And that's something that was planned when that subdivision went in. And originally, I was looking at possibly a cul-de-sac, but because these roads were here, it's to interconnect and make sure all everything can keep connecting up and the traffic can be clean. And that's one of the reasons because of our demographic that we're looking for, we don't want that being a thorough, like a thorough way. Like that's why we want to squeeze our roads down a little bit, which is kind of the way Chris Pam is slowly going is bringing them from the raceways we got, squeezing them. And then when I say squeeze points, it's, well, you know, we put up the yellow barricades. We'd actually shape the road a little bit and that's just to slow people down. They're gonna, everybody have a nice walkway to go on. And then we can pop out yet two directions so we can kind of split our traffic too, right? Some people would like going lower. Some people might like going up higher. So we can disperse our traffic pretty good that way too, I think. Thank you. Um, another question I have is actually about the narrow roads um, because it almost seems like it's the opposite of what we're thinking about with active transportation. So I know you've addressed great walking trails, so that's wonderful. But as we narrow the streets now, the people that want to bike are being thrown into traffic. Yep. So I'm not sure if you could address that or maybe Mr. Colburn could talk to that in terms of what, the, I know it's a residential street, but I'm just a little concerned with, as we start to merge, you know, different kinds of vehicle on the road, if that's gonna create a safety issue. So that'd be more for Mr. Colburn, I think. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, Your Worship, thank you, thank you, uh, Councillor Luck. So just a, I guess, point of clarification. So when we talk about narrower roads versus narrower right-of-ways, so our typical right-of-way width, so that's what the land the municipality owns for road development purposes from basically property line to property line of residential properties is typically 20 meters wide. When we say we're narrowing, in this particular case, is we're narrowing the right-of-way. So you're narrowing from 20 meter wide allocation for road development down to 16. What that allows you to do in this particular case, by narrowing the right-of-way, you can actually bring the buildings closer 
which gives you more room in the backyard for buffers and those types of things. Within that 16 meter wide right of way, you're still building your typical, you could still tip build your typical eight meter road, eight meter wide asphalt, right? So you're, we're not actually in this particular case, narrowing down to smaller driving surfaces. You're just reducing the right of way, but still allocating a similar street design. The choke points would be probably sort of curbed areas or bumped out areas, which you would still have to look at if we move through our transportation master plan or whatever comes out in terms of AT reviews, incorporating bike lanes or uh, shared routes. In this particular case, we're adding a, a walking path on, on the uh, outside of the driving surface area. So this is point of clarification. We're not actually sort of, it's, it's the right of way. So you can build building, buildings forward. When we look at that from a planning perspective, there are certain elements that we look at before we do that. Your stormwater management is an underground system because if you need your typical road width and then you have to put in ditches, when you put the back slopes to your ditches, are you on, it, can you put it in, in the 20 meter wide right away or can you do it in the 16? So there's certain criteria that has to be met before we consider reducing the right of ways. So just a point of clarification. So all those elements will still have to be taken into consideration in terms of the street design. Yep. Um, you do mention um, lots of different elements of accessibility. And I know that right now there isn't an actual housing standard. It's coming on accessibility, but it's not quite here yet. Um, I'm wondering if you're actually following any type of universal design standard, or is it just kind of like we're doing a few things, or are you going to actually follow some universal design um, guidelines? We are, we're looking into the universal design. We've been looking at some of the Rick Hansen. I've been talking with the owner of Novalti out of Ontario, and, and these, that's what they do. They disable people, um, the elderly. So we're, we're trying to work with everybody, but it is hard to find all the standards. Um, we want to go, we won't necessarily be making the units like that you could maybe put a, a wheelchair under your, your sink, but we would have everything that if you were in a wheelchair, let's say, you have all your grab bars, you have an accessible washroom, you can get at all your rooms. Um, as we said, uh, the, we're going to attempt to get zero step, which in, in certain areas are, but we may even put a cement walkway so we can landscape to it. Uh, and that's part of the trails. So we're trying to incorporate as many of these things into these homes as we possibly can. And we're more, we're open to anything. We're open to bringing more things into them as well because it is something that's missing nowadays. We, we don't have it anywhere. And some of it's very simple. So, you're welcome. Deputy Mayor Schreier. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. I did have a follow-up question, so uh, I I wanted to talk, um, ask a little bit about the stormwater management plan, and my concern is um, Ritchie Lake and runoff. Um, I know that saving the trees it really helps. Um, so, have we done any studies on um, silt in Ritchie Lake, and if we expect there to be any additional runoff because of a um, project of this size? Thank you, Your Worship. So I guess two parts. First, uh, in terms of an actual study that isolates the change in Ritchie Lake in terms of uh, sediment or silt that's, that's entered the lake and, and changed uh, anything with respect to the lake in terms of depths or just aquaculture and those types of things. Nothing to knowledge comes to mind since I've been in with the municipality. Um, however, I guess the second part is when we look at actual developments and stormwater management. Again, it goes back to our policy and our, our development standards is that you have to do net zero. So you have to control all the water pre and post. So you have to demonstrate that you're incorporating storm, storm attenuation measures to ensure that the flows are controlled and you're not uh, causing downstream impacts. That downstream impact also includes erosion, sediment, those types of things. So stormwater management, I know a lot of times it's focused on the quantity of water that's coming off. There's also standards in terms of 
quality. So there are guidelines in terms of total suspended solids that you actually have to build. So if you're, if you're getting an excess amount of silt that's coming off of your site, then you have to build catchment areas or plunge pools where the water actually dissipates. So it sits for a while, the sediments actually sit, settle into these, these areas, and then the cleaner water spills over and actually goes into. And these areas can be incorporated into the design of your stormwater management system. They have to be maintained, those little types of things. However, they are part of the standard when we look at stormwater management. It is both quantity and quality of the water that's running off. And that becomes very important when you have fish bearing uh, streams or ponds that's receiving that. Department of Fisheries has standards in terms of the amount of suspended solids that can be released. So all of that stuff is taken into consideration and part of the stormwater management plan that we would look at. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any other councillors wishing to speak? Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, we've had a good discussion here with, uh, with resident input and uh, developer input and staff input. And uh, when it comes to the first reading, uh, what happens if, if it is approved, that triggers the, uh, the transfer to our uh, development uh, officer to evaluate the pros and cons of the discussions that have taken place during the presentation. And it's council that relies on their expertise and input to uh, provide us with the best information to uh, move on to the uh, second and third reading. So um, just a bit of uh, a bit of process there. But uh, on that uh, on that basis, I would like to move. Before you do, Councillor Olson, uh, I just want to check procedure here. Okay, sure. Should we read this before? Uh, if somebody wouldn't mind reading page 173, the uh, notice of decision. Uh, Oh, PAC's recommendations. Does anyone have those up? Thank you, Councillor Miller. Pick up Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm going to read the PAC notice. So take notice, the decision of the Quist Hampshire's Planning Advisory Committee was rendered in the matter of your request pursuant to the Community Planning Act of New Brunswick. The matter requested, council seeking planning advisory, I'll skip all the, the numbers. Um, the date and place of consideration was March the 8th, 2022. Planning advising committee, committee meeting was here in the town hall. So this is the decision of the committee uh, based on the application. That the planning advisory committee proceed with supporting council in the rezoning of PIDs 00251694 and 30216527 from single or two family dwell dwelling R1 to Terrence dwelling residential R3 with distinct ownership subject to the following items and conditions. A full comprehensive traffic flow analysis will be required and submitted. Number two, a detailed comprehensive water supply and source assessment, which is CWSSA, report by a certified professional engineer is to also be completed and submitted. An engineered design stormwater management plan and drainage system stamped by the registered professional engineer licensed to practice in the province of New Brunswick is to be completed and submitted for each phase of the development. Number four, a site design showing the creation of buffer, buffering zones as it relates to the neighboring residential R1 zones must be approved to the town by the town prior to consideration. And number five, street lighting installation on the entrance to the development is required. Number six, all building lights are to be downward directed. Number seven, all materials and equipment ordered on site are the responsibility of the developer. Number eight, the developer is to enter into the developer's agreement with the town of Quispam Sis. Number nine, the developer shall undertake to complete the work for each approved phase within a period of two years following the approval. Number 10, the land shall be developed in accordance with the most recently dated building and development plans filed and approved by the town for each phase and 
Number 11, if the development does not substantially proceed within six months of the date of approval for each phase, the de developer shall restore the lands to the attractive natural state and such restoration will to be completed within one month. Uh, other, the Planning Advisory Committee PAC support is only for the rezoning of PIDs 00251694 and 3021627, also known as 124 Pettengill Road, from single or fa two-family dwelling R1 to terrace dwelling residential R3 with distinct ownership as outlined in the received plans. Further review of PAC may be required as the development proceeds. This was dated the 10th day of, of March 2022, um, signed by Violet Brown, Secretary, Quispamsis Planning Advisory Committee. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Now a motion may be presented and voted upon on the subject. Councillor Olson, please. Thank you. I would move that first reading be given to zoning bylaw amendment number 034-35, rezoning property identified as 124 Pettingill Road with PID numbers 3021652 and 0025-1694 from single and two family residential R1 to terrace dwelling residential R3. Thank you, Councillor Olson. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Please vote now. Uh, motion carried 6-0. Did you vote in favor of the motion? So there should be 6-0. Okay. Motion carried 6-0. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here this evening. Did no one vote? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. It should be seven. You just have to check. Uh, okay, so it was the deputy mayor. Your worship. Who's speaking? Oh, uh, Councillor Donovan, yes. Did you um, vote in favor? On, uh, I did vote in favor, but on my iPad, it shows Deputy Mayor Schreier is absent. Yes. Okay. So we've got I that corrected. So the vote resulted in a 7 0 in favor of the first reading. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience this evening. It's been a long night. And Councillor Miller. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, for those that are, are new, we talked about this a little bit last time, but you do first and second reading at the same time doesn't mean that it's passed. And, and, and so. But um, knowing that, I'd still like to do a second reading be given to zoning bylaw amendment number 038-35 rezoning property identified as 124 Pettengill Road and PIDs number 3021657 and 0025-1694 from single and two family residential R1 to terrace dwelling residential R3. Thank you, Councillor Miller. It's been moved by Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Seeing there are none, please vote now. Seven zero. Motion carried, 7-0. Once again, thank you very much for being here this evening. Safe travels, everyone. Item number seven, minutes of the previous meeting. Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. I would move that the minutes for the previous uh, meeting be approved as prepared. It's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Councillor Miller on the question. Please vote now.
Motion carried 7-0. Item number 8A, unfinished business, June 2019, carried over 2021, application for financing, MB Municipal Finance Corporation, staff report from the town treasurer. Councillor Olson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Resolved that the clerk and or treasurer and or mayor be authorized to issue and sell to the New Brunswick Municipal Finance Corporation, a municipality of Quispam Sista Venture, in the principal amount of $2,081,000 on such terms and conditions as are recommended by the New Brunswick Municipal Finance Corporation, and be it resolved that the municipality of Quispam Sis agree to issue post-dated checks payable to the New Brunswick Municipal Finance Corporation as and when they are requested in payment of principal and interest charges on the above debenture. Thank you, Councillor Olson. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Thompson on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 7 0. Item number B Professional Development Schedule, Deputy Mayor Scryer, staff report from the town clerk. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Scryer. Uh, I put a motion forward as this is for council information only. A motion to receive and file the town clerk staff report. It's been moved by Deputy Mayor Scryer, seconded by Councillor Olson on the question. Please vote now. Uh, Motion carried 7 0. Item number C carried from March. 2022, ratification of email poll, a six by four truck cab and chassis RFP number 2022 TQ01-2. Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. I would move that council ratify the email poll conducted by the town clerk on March 3rd, 2022, authorizing the award of tender number 2022 TQ01-2 for a six by four truck cab and chassis to universal truck and trailer for the tender price of $182,675 plus HST, not including $185 for plates and levy. It's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Deputy Mayor Scryer. On the question, please vote now. Motion carried. Motion carried 7 0. Item number 8 D. Ratification of email poll of March 2022. Tender number 2022 TQ01 3. Water reservoir recoating project. Councillor Bigger. Your Worship, I would move the council ratify the email poll conducted by the town clerk on March 3rd, 2022 authorizing the award of tender number 2022 TQ01-3, Water Reservoir Recoding Project to Jamak Painting and Sandblasting for the low tender price of $593,400, including HST, and further that $250,000 be reallocated from the Utility Capital Reserve Fund to the budget for the project. It's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Deputy Mayor Scryer on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 7-0. Item number 9A, rezoning application, Rugged Residential Inc., Maple Ridge Estates, proposed bare land condo cluster development off Corduroy Road, off Elliott Road, rural RU to multiple residential R2. We Do we have Mr. Bigger, Viger. Mm -hmm. 
Is there a motion? Or? Uh, the motion was to move forward with the public hearing. Whereas this is a rezoning application, it's important that the uh, proponent and his team be present to present and to answer any questions. As they don't appear to be present, it may be in order to table or to defer this item to a later date and arrange it with the applicant and proponent. Thank you. So could we have a motion, please, to defer this to a later date? Councillor Olson. Thank you, Worship. I would uh, move that uh, we refer, refer item uh, 9A to uh, our next council meeting or when the uh, applicants are able to attend. It's been, it's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Miller on the question. Please vote now. Motion. Motion carried, Your Worship. Motion carried, seven zero. Item nine B. Anne Olivia Smith, Gondola Point Streetscape Upgrade, request for asphalt sidewalk to be separated from roads similar to Gondola Boulevard Streetscape. Councillor Miller. Thank you, Your Worship. I would move that Ms. Smith be thanked for her correspondence and she be informed that Council will be reviewing streetscape options for the upgrade of the Gondola Point Road over the coming year and the pedestrian movement will be a strong component of the final strategic plan. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Luck. On the question, please vote now. <clears throat> Motion carried 7 0. Number 10 bylaws, July 2021. Local improvement bylaw number 011 2021. Levying of costs of property owners for 2021 storm sewer drainage installations. Staff report from the town clerk. Is there a motion there? Councillor Miller. Thank you, Your Worship. Notice of warrant of assessment. <coughs> Excuse me. Whereas pursuant to bylaw number 011-2021 passed on the 20th day of July 2021, the Council of Town of Quistam says has completed as local improvement the installation of storm sewer works at a cost of $47,616.81 within the 12 months preceding the 31st day of March 2022. And whereas pursuant to bylaw number 001-2021 of the town of Quisfamsis, the owner's portion of the cost of the work to be raised by frontage frontal assessment is $35,712.61. And whereas such frontage assessment is payable in either a lump sum or 10 annual installments, the town treasurer therefore requested to assess the levy of a sum of $35,712.61 on the several pars parcels of land abutting on on the said work and cause them to be collected and paid by either one lump sum or 10 annual installments by the owner of such parcels in accordance with the provisions of the bylaws of the town of Quispam Sis. Amen. It's been moved by Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. On the question, Councillor Olson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I'm aware of uh, one more uh, a possible addition to this project work. Is it too late for us to add uh, another uh, another driveway to it, or another property? Your worship, if I may speak to that, this is from last year's uh, bylaw. Oh, okay. Okay, so then the work is done, it's already done through the construction. These are the actual costs. The bylaw was based on estimated costs, and now the tax will be levied onto these property owners. The if there is an interest for the 2022, have them contact the town hall, the, okay. the office. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. 
on the question, please vote now. Councillor Donovan, are you still with yes, us? Yes. Yeah, okay, we got your vote. Seven, zero. Motion carried 7 0. Item number 11A, new business, award of tender number 2022 TQ 01 4, Qplex Lighting Upgrade Staff Report from Director of Community Services. Moved by Councillor Olson, would you please do the motion? I'd move Council Award Tender Number. 2022 TQ 01 4 for the Qplex lighting upgrade to FCC Engineering Limited with the bid price of $125,580 exclusive of HST. Getting a little punchy. Over Moved here. by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Please vote now. Oh, Councillor Donovan, do you have a question? Yeah, I did. It was just a really quick one. Um, my question is through you to the uh, director of community services. It says that we could, um, you know, apply to the New Brunswick power business rebate program. I I don't mean to put her on the spot, but does she maybe know like how much we could potentially get back through that program? Is there like a percentage that she could give me or like a rough estimate? Maybe it's not like a big issue or anything. I'm just curious. We will do our best. Just hold on one second, please. Director of Community Services. Your Worship, we anticipate a ten to $15,000 grant through that program. Did you hear that, Councillor Donovan? A ten to $15,000 grant. Okay, thank you. Please vote now. Motion carried 7 0. Item number 11B under new business award of tender number 2022 TQ01 1 Consulting Services Recreation Master Plan. Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. I would move to award RFP 2022 TQ01 1 for the Recreation Master Plan to trace planning and design for the bid price of $57,540.25 inclusive of HST. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Councillor Thompson. On the question, please vote now. Motion carried 7-0. Thank you. Item number 11C, award of tender 2022 TQ03-8. Pre-filled sandbags, if required, for emergency spring freshet flood event. Councillor Olson, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'd move the Council Award RFP number 2022-TQ03-8 for contractor-filled sandbags to the sole bid, uh, sole bid from Brookville Manufacturing for the bid price of $50,400, exclusive of HST. Agreement was only will only be awarded if emergency measures are required. Otherwise, it's been moved um, by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Councillor Miller, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Your Worship. This, this one I struggle with. Um, due to the fact that we're, I know we're not out of the pandemic, but things have changed, where we voted for this a couple of years ago when we couldn't be close to somebody, we couldn't fill in sandbags. I don't know if we can now, but it's also, it should be at the onus of the, uh, the, the residents to buy their own sandbags if that becomes an issue. So um, that, that's, that's my only challenge with this. But, but uh, I know things continue to change and we may be into the point where we can't get together, but the old days we had a big pile and somebody wanted to fill it up, they fill it up, so that's fine. But I, 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 last question, sorry. I thought we'd bought some before and I thought we had spares. Like, are they all gone? Like I thought we had some put away somewhere because from years ago, maybe not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. I do recall that we had some, but I think they were used for the second flood for the 20, 
what was it, 2019 flood? Yeah. Councillor Luck, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a few comments on this. I did go back to this discussion dated April the 6th, 21, and watched the video. Um, just because I was, I, 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 it seems like it's almost Groundhog Day. It keeps coming up every year, this discussion. So I wanted to go back and find out what previous council had talked about. And from what I could tell was that there is no provincial policy for municipalities to supply sandbags. Um, and that was from a letter um, from Ms. Minister Urquhart at the time, and dated 2019. Um, and I know at that point, council had asked for more clarity. So I'm not sure if we have any additional clarity at this time, because they were asking for it back then in terms of what exactly there was, a, I think, a, a little bit of, um, it wasn't very clear how the letter was written in terms of whose responsibility it was. Also, it was very clearly stated in that um, council session that the pre-filled was due to COVID restrictions. Um, and it was only, and of course, it was only in case of emergency as it is uh, written here. But in the past, it was, there was a big pile of sand and residents filled their own sandbags. And the reason we were going to this in the past was because of the COVID restrictions, which now we don't actually have. Um, and then also just some of the quotes were, you know, we have to start encouraging residents to prepare for the emergencies. We have to make it very clear that our residents um, are responsible to prepare as we move forward. Um, so again, I know that we're trying to plan for, you know, potentially the worst, but I guess I'm not sure why an RFP has already been sent out for sandbags before council has agreed to do it because it is a contentious issue every year. Um, and then also, what is our responsibility as a town? Thank you, Councillor Luck. Would, would you like... Okay, okay. <laughs> Councillor Olson. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was my understanding uh, that uh, the town had a responsibility in an emergency situation to provide that coverage. Now, I, I uh, stand to be corrected. But uh, that is why uh, our CEO uh, recommended that this plan be put in place to cover that uh, uh, potential situation. So that's why the, uh, the tag on it was agreement will only be awarded with, uh, if emergency measures are required. So I thought that it was something that, was, uh, that the province had uh, dictated to us and our hands were tied. Now maybe, maybe our CEO can clarify that. Thank you, Councillor Olson. I'm going to go to Deputy Mayor Scryer first for her question, and then I'll go to Acting CAO so you can answer all of them. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I guess it's more of a comment than a question, and it has to do with when the, um, on the same vein as um, Councillor Olson, when an emergency is declared, that the town be able to assist in any way possible. So I would hope that... Um, if there was an emergency, and we hope not, River Watch has started last week, I think, uh, that there would be um, um, availability of sandbags for residents that may need it. I know a lot of work has been done in residents' homes to um, prepare and try to um, make it, mitigate um, any type of flooding. So let's hope that uh, the river stays low. Your Worship, if I may, uh, I do believe we need a motion of council to proceed after 11 o'clock under the procedural bylaw. That we do. I was just going to suggest that. I was just looking at the time. Could we please have a motion to proceed after 11 o'clock? Moved by Councillor Baker, seconded by Councillor Miller. Please vote now. Let's have a show of hands, please. Motion carried 7-0. We'll go back to the acting CAO. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, as council knows, I wasn't in this position when this um, item came before council last April. But the reference to the letter sent by Minister Urquhart in July of 2019, to me, seems quite clear. Uh, in the penultimate paragraph, it says, specific to sandbags and sand, our approach is intentionally to incent property owners to acquire, fill, and install them themselves in preparing for flooding just as we encourage them to prepare for power outages and other risks. Where they fail to do so, 
Hopefully in declining numbers as lessons are learned, it falls to local governments to fill the gap. The Emergency Measures Act uh, under the definition of emergency means a present or imminent event in respect of which the minister or municipality as the case may be, believes prompt coordination of action or regulation of persons or property must be undertaken to protect property, the environment, or the health, safety, or welfare of the civil population. We have incented, which I'm not really sure that's my favorite verb, but we have done that with our residents, and they've accepted that challenge, and they have taken mitigation measures over the last number of years. Uh, in 2019, we had 18,678, 18,678, Sandbags went out the door onto trucks and were delivered to residents who required them. In 2020, thankfully, at the start of the pandemic, we did not have the need. There was no emergency flooding situation, but we had polled our residents who had required sandbags previously to see how many they required in case we did have an emergency flood situation. The number of 18,678 had diminished to 11,560. We did the same thing last year because again, we were still in COVID and that number had dropped to 10,325. Um, we do have around 3,300 uh, bags in reserve and the works department has reason to use them as well. Again, this is totally when we reach, if we reach an emergency flood situation which is 4.7 forecast and rising in the Cannabacasis River. That's happened five times in the last 60 years. Unfortunately, in 2018, we had the 100 year flood. In 2019, we had the 100 year flood again. So I do, staff thinks that it's the responsibility of the municipality as, as Councillor Olson and I think the Deputy Mayor alluded to, uh, in that situation, um, if the flood waters are forecast to reach 4.7 meters and continue to rise, um, the flood will be the number one news story in New Brunswick. That will be on activated our emergency measures, the fire department, St. John, the regional emergency measures organization through the River Watch program. All of those things will have been activated that we would be in what we would consider an emergency situation. Um, failing that, residents are on their own and as we can see from that tremendous reduction in numbers from 18,678 in 2019 to the request for just over 10,000 last year, um, that there have been mitigation measures taken by a number of our residents in Gondola Point Road, Means Cove Road, Model Farm, Forester's Cove, Goose Down Lane. Those are really the areas that are, are mostly affected. We are fortunate in Crisp Ham Sis that other than you know, keeping an eye on our pumping stations, we don't have any specific municipal infrastructure that's impacted by flooding. We don't have roads. We're not Darlings Island that literally attracts national media attention and they've taken some mitigation efforts there since the most recent flood as well and hopefully that works this year. Um, but it is just those residents um, that require our help. So that's why this was put forward. Um, it's not binding on council. If council chooses to uh, not move forward with that RFP, um, that's certainly council's will. And again, this would only be implemented if the floodwaters hit that 4.7 forecast number and continue to rise. Um, and traditionally, as I mentioned, that would trigger a lot of um, provincial reaction, which also triggers disaster assistance funding. So chances are we would get most, if not all of that funding back um, if we had to uh, implement the Emergency Measures Operations Center and move forward at that time. I hope that answered everyone's questions, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Councillor Luck. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Mr. Kennedy. Um, thank you for the clarity. I think that letter might have come in. I think it was dated in July, so it does provide some clarity from the questions that were asked in April. So thank you for that. The one question I still have that was um, quite dis discussed at length was the issue of pre-filled sandbags versus the pile of sand in the sand, because again, it was very clearly stated the only reason they were doing pre-filled because they're quite a lot more expensive it was because of the COVID restrictions. So I'm, I guess maybe it's too late to do anything about it now, but I guess I'm just wondering, hopefully we'll never have to deal with COVID again. Um, but if this is gonna be something that we potentially plan for every year, when will we be going back to the pile of sand and having sandbags just because in terms of the cost? Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Council Luck and to the rest of Council. 
It was interesting if we look back to 2018, which was really a generational flood. That was the worst, we, well, it turned out to be the worst we'd ever seen, but a lot of people were reflecting on 1973. Um, it was a very remarkable response by our residents. Um, the sand pit up at the, um, at the Civic Center behind the fire station was sort of the place to be. It was, I think, fun. It was exciting because it was new and the opportunity to come out and to volunteer your time and, and to help your neighbors in their time of need. Um, that volunteer human resource number dwindled a little bit the following year. It's like, wow, we don't want to do this every year. Um, this 100-year flood is supposed to be once every 100 years, not in consecutive years. So that's why we went forward with this plan through the pandemic. Um, you know, as we heard with the, the first presentation tonight, the pandemic isn't over by any stretch of the imagination. And sadly, one of our members is watching remotely tonight because of uh, COVID. So there was some concern that because of that, because anecdotally, certainly a lot of people in this room tonight were wearing masks, that it might be difficult again to call upon that volunteer human contingent. Um, our staff can only do so much. Um, so just not knowing um, and wanting to ensure that we're prepared if we need to respond in an emergency flood situation, we thought it was best to move forward with a plan for pre-filled sandbags again this year. And I know you've heard this before, it's not our long-term plan, but unfortunately with COVID still with us and we are almost into April that we thought that was the best way to go. But we don't wanna see this moving forward either, but um, we just thought for this year, we would bring it back to council for your approval. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'd just like to suggest that uh, based on the new numbers that we've had, uh, declining numbers over the number of years, we're not obligated in that uh, in that bid price to take to spend the whole fifty thousand four hundred. Would we? Uh, uh, just referring this to our CEO. I mean. Uh, you know, we might uh, be able to take it in chunks if necessary. That's all. That's my question. Yeah, I would say that's fair, Your Worship, uh, through you to Councillor Olson, that they're reasonable in dealing with this, and they know as well that they, they don't get a whole lot of advance notice. They can't say, we need to know tomorrow if you want the bags or not, that this is something that, you know, one year was in early May, and I think the second year was in early April, mid-April. So that's definitely something that I'm sure would be uh, reasonable from their perspective and ours. Thank you once again. We have a motion on the table, I believe. It was moved by Councillor Olson. Olson and seconded by Councillor Baker. Baker. Thank you. Please vote now. Motion carried seven zero. Reports, item number 12. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd move we receive and file reports. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 7-0. Business arising from Committee of the Whole. I don't believe there was any. Item number 14. Adjournment. Councillor Olson. Moved by Councillor Olson. Seconded by Councillor Miller. On the question, please vote now. Motion carried 7-0. Hope you find joy in the rest of this week. Good night, everybody. Good night, Councillor Donovan. I hope you're feeling better very soon. Heading right to bed. Thank you. Attaboy, Noah.